Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Jim Cornette Experience. It's getting closer to Christmas, folks, and I can't wait. I'm going to be coming down a lot of you people's chimneys in the next week or 10 days or so by Cracky. We're going to talk about that today. But anyway, on the program, besides my Santa corny Christmas update, viewer mail, we're going to talk about what will bring CM Punk back to pro wrestling. We're going to talk about wrestlers warring weekly, very weekly, on Wednesdays. The two Tonys sure did need Don West with them. And so much more. And to join me in this, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. He's the new owner of the French Toast Home Shopping Network. He'll sell you a slice in a New York second. The great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. I'm not quite sure where that one came from here at the top. <laughs> as, I've seen, as I've watched wrestling, what they call wrestling, oh my God, I'm slappy because I've been trying to fulfill all my customers. I've been trying to service all my, my people out there. But as I've tried to watch these wrestling programs over the last day and a half or so, I have come to the realization that it's a mixture of the home shopping network and hostage videos. Either there's Tony Schiavati and Tony Khan <laughs> trying to sell you. It looked like they were doing a local cable access version of a home shopping network episode or uh, poor old Pete Dunn. I think he's the one that stands out in my mind, but there were a number of these. That were out there delivering their scripted verbiage like a hostage statement. I have joined the Symbionese Liberation Army. I am being treated well. <laughs> to my parents, do not try to find me. Call me Tanya. Call, call me. <laughs> you can call me Al or call me baby or I'll call you long distance. How about that? It's just, oh, uh, but maybe it's just my mood. And you've been angry, Brian, last lately. I chided you gently. Oh, come on. About that before, right before we went on, on the air here for public consumption. How does it feel to be consuming us, ladies and gentlemen? You've been, because you, your time has been short. It's getting near the holidays. You got the family there. I've got the, the Castle Empire here and the, and the Cornets Collectibles customers. You've got the Arcadian Vanguard Network. I have a puppy with its belly that needs to be rubbed. We got a lot going on. And having to sit down and peruse this programming for potential review, critique, dissection, and dissertation has 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 been weighing on you more heavily than it has on me. I hope you'll be in a more cordial tone here this week as we relate some activities for the folks. I think anyone who listens to these shows regularly knows that I'm a pretty happy-go-lucky, fun-loving guy, but sometimes, and it's happened a few times recently, the state of modern wrestling gets to me only because I have to watch it. <laughs> But other than that, I love life, and every day is wonderful and beautiful. The happy-go-lucky. The happy-go-lucky Brian Last, everybody. That's right. Footloose and Fancy Free. That actually was a song on Jerry Lawler's first album. Happy-go-lucky. I'm trying to think of who wrote it. My God, I've looked at the back of that album and the songwriting credits and everything. He covered a Jagger and Richard, Richards tune. He covered some old... Uh, uh, Memphis and Nashville oriented stuff, but when I'm happy, go lucky, lucky in love with you. It was, it was, it was, it was an amazing release. You remember that album, Brian? No, I'm not. I'm not a big fan of the Jerry Lawler albums and Jerry Lawler singles. And other than Wimp Busters, which is late era Lawler when it comes oh, to the God. album catalog. I'm not a big fan of Lawler the singer. But now that first album, he he had the he had the Elvis because it was 1978, right? He had the Elvis Presley full length black jumpsuit. Didn't have rhinestones and shit, but the full length black jumpsuit open at the chest with the hairy chest and everything. He, he and Dundee was starting to do that right at that point. Dundee went full on Vegas Elvis jumpsuit. 
Lawler tried to stay more with the fucking, you know, the cool black and the sunglass Elvis kind of thing. But, but that first album, it was, it was, it was, but but you can't tell me that you didn't like bad news. You're not, you're not old enough to be a bad news fan. You're right. I I mean, I'm not a bad news fan. I don't know if the age has anything to do with it. I think taste is probably more. The no, no, it. because that was that was heel Lawler in like 1970 fucking. Oh my god, it was 74, right? So it was heel Lawler. Wrestlers didn't do records at all back then. They play that video on TV. The old John D. Louder Milk song, "Bad News Travels Like Wildfire, Good News Travels Slow." They all call me old wildfire because everybody knows that I'm bad news. They tried to hang me in Nashville. They did down in Tupelo, but I wouldn't choke. I broke the rope, so they had to let me go because I'm bad news. That was fucking classic. Oh, yeah. But Jimmy Jimmy Hart's uh, 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 songwriting and musical chops did help Lawler's later emissions, submissions, recordings, whatever, whatever you might call it. I think I've told you before, but my philosophy is and I like some of Jimmy Hart's stuff, but I think as a songwriter, he's overrated even for wrestling. Oh, come on. Because, now. Listen to me. Hear me out. You can take any Jimmy Hart song and it's it's Blue Suede Shoes. <laughs> any Jimmy Hart song, you could sing to the tune of Blue Suede Shoes and it works because that's every single song he writes. <laughs> for the most part, there are a few exceptions. Eat Your Heart Out, Rick Springfield was, was a hot number. Until people forgot who Rick Springfield was in 1985. Well, and what about Barbara Streisand's nose that was later... Lance uh, Russell's nose. Later switched to Lance Russell's nose. And of course, there was the old, Tammy, why not give George another chance? <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite Jimmy Hart song? Um, we Hate School. It had to okay. be. But besides, I heard that literally every fucking night. Um... I was the guy that was, uh, for example, in Evansville, Indiana, I would carry the uh, the tape player that they would use to play the entrance because not everybody had entrance music back then, right? It was only for the main event guys. So for Handsome Jimmy, Son of a Gypsy, which Jimmy Hart wrote. See there? And what oh, hold on. Okay. Oh. Okay. Son of a gypsy. Now, you know the lyrics. We all know the lyrics. And I was about to say, because I would I would carry these things around at the spot shows in Evansville. I had the tape player at spot shows it, on Thursdays. I had the tape player. I listened to him in Louisville. I memorized these fucking songs. I heard them in my sleep. I came rolling into Mempho, TWA. Tell all the ladies, handsome Jimmy's on his way. I'm a rocker and a roller, a little funky too. I was Dude. raised by the gypsies. You know, baby handsome's cool. Again, to my philosophy of Blue Suede Shoes. <laughs> I came rolling into Mempho, TWA. Tell all the women, handsome Jimmy's on the way. Don't you step on my Blue Suede Shoes. It's a, Every song <laughs> is Blue Suede Shoes. Tell all the ladies, Jimmy's on the loose. They can run and hide, but they can't fly the coop. I'm a rocker and a roller, a little funky too. A lot of, Ooh, people, messy. A lot of people think he says a little funky Jew because it absolutely <laughs> sounds like it absolutely sounds like he's saying that. Well, see, nobody thought that in in Tennessee. They thought he was saying something about he was going to fuck somebody too. <laughs> see, they didn't automatically go to the to the to the Jewish element. They went to the fucking. But you see, you said not a lot of guys had records, but actually, I mean, there may have been more records in that territory in the early days than anyone else. I mean, Len Rossi had a record, The Wrestler's Prayer. Yeah, Fargo. Yeah, Fargo had a record, right? Sputnik. Sputnik had a record. Plowboy Frazier had a record. Sputnik's in, what, 1960? Um, pencil Neck, no, Pencil Neck Geek was geek. goddamn uh, Blast uh, Blassie, but Yeah. Uh, goddamn Sputnik, Sputnik's record. Now you've scared the title out of me. Oh fuck. Well, anyway, we'll come back and put that in later. So it knows like I look. Uh, it looks like I know what I'm talking about. But anyway, he just did all of it, all of his shit, all of his promo lines. You know, what's the matter with you, ignorance? Blah, 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 over of uh, some song, uh, some musical background. It wasn't really that he was singing or anything, but it still people loved it. But the the reason why all the Memphis guys had records or there was so many records out of the Memphis territory is two things. Number one, Memphis was a huge, you know, hotbed of music and a, a center of, you know, Sun Records and everybody else. Secondly, Sam Phillips, his sons loved wrestling. 
and they love Sputnik Monroe. Uh, Knox and Jerry were, you know, like in Sputnik's fan club. And then Jackie Fargo was so big in Memphis that he was hooked up with that country singer, Eddie Bond, that he owned a radio station. And then Lawler was the most popular local celebrity on television. And everybody, the, as a matter of fact, several members of the Atlanta rhythm section played on some of Lawler's records at that point in time. They had legitimate musicians, you know, doing stuff with the wrestlers because it was wrestling was so big in that territory. So that's why there were so many records, whether, whether all the guys could sing or not. I mean, Plowboy Frazier, for heaven's sake. No Dundee record, though. Oh, can you imagine? I, I wish. Be- <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I think Dundee was probably too egotistical to do anything that he wouldn't have been really good at. And uh, and I can't see that happening. Come on, Bill. Come Whereas on. some of the other the guys didn't have, <laughs> some of the other guys didn't have such qualms as that. But actually, Lawler, they, they, Lawler had a few things that worked, and they, and they produced him. I mean, you know, Phil Spector didn't set up a wall of sound like they did over the top of some of Jerry's vocals. But Handsome Jimmy was himself, and that song was really him. Um, most of the guys that did something, it kind of, it fit who they were, and they weren't really trying to necessarily transition into a music career. They were just trying to, you know, but I guarantee you Jimmy Valiant sold easily. 25,000 copies of that 45 record at the matches in the Tennessee territory. Yeah. And how many copies has he sold since then for that was the one. Remember a few years back, (laughs) Scott Cornish saw a copy. I don't know if it was on eBay or somewhere, but it was being sold by big mama. (laughs) Like She had copies of Jimmy's records and he wanted to buy one. And she said, you know, she was very nice. Like, okay, you know, give me a, a little while to get back to you. And he gave her a little more than a little while, and he got back in touch. He goes, hey, I'm still interested. And she responded, I'm starting to think you don't deserve this record. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably in a box in, in one of the garages that she got in, uh, in that settlement. But you know what? That is a wonderful segue to an update on Santa Corny's sleigh, ladies and gentlemen. If you have recently patronized jimcornette.com and ordered some of the fine Cornette's collectibles merchandise like everybody in the known universe. You did take, uh, they took to heart, Brian, the, the advice I gave them, get your orders in quick because we got snowed over the weekend and I'm not talking about the weather. And uh, it, the time has officially passed that I announced that I could promise you that I'd get it out in the mail in time for you to get it by Christmas, that was the, what is today as they're hearing this now? December the 11th? Friday so that the 11th. Was a couple days ago. So I'm telling you right now, I am still filling orders that I'm getting. And some of you, it, it, stranger things have happened, for heaven's sake. So you might still get it by Christmas, but you're on your own, as they say. Uh, as we mentioned here on one of the most recent programs, that's all I've done lately is pack packages and then come and do these programs. They're short three clerks at the window at the post office this week, right in time, quarantined, right in time for the holiday rush. Somebody tweeted a picture, and I retweeted this over the weekend from Louisville here. It was on, I think, Wave 3 News, that one of the uh, uh, probably disgruntled postal employees at the main sorting facility just uh, tweeted a picture of just like, imagine just not even as, as... well put together as the warehouse that they hid the Ark of the Covenant in in the last scene of the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Not even that, just shit laying everywhere. Packages. Packages as far as the eye could see. And uh, and, and that's like that all over the country because people are mailing instead of taking things in person and everything. So, folks, right now, everything is in the mail through that has been ordered, believe it or not, through Monday, December 7th, except for about a dozen international packages that are wrapped up and ready to go. But I still, right now, I have all that I can ship through probably next Wednesday, uh, December the 16th, uh, because I've got uh, literally a hundred and something things stacked up down there and blah, blah, blah. So, just so you know, I've given you the caveat. I'm still taking orders. You might not get it before Christmas. 
uh, if you go to the site, you will notice that some T-shirts in some sizes have been taken off sale. That's not a problem. Don't drive yourself crazy if you can't get an extra large thank you, fuck you, bye. The choice has been taken away from you because they are gone. I can't get more before Christmas. But if you have already successfully ordered a shirt, you will still get it. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic film sets are off sale until next year because I had stocked a bunch up, but we've sold out. Those are the custom maids. I don't have time to do more. Uh, the whole wang-dang-doodle of a website will be open. The store, I should say, at the website will be open until December 31st. And some point that day, we will go offline and the store will be closed in the month of January, so we got time to restock and refresh. Any orders that come in through December 31st, I will fill, hopefully immediately afterwards, and we will be back in February. I love you all, but you're driving me slowly mad. So I just want to make sure we got that out there. So now I guarantee you I'll have 25 people emailing me. Now let me, let me get this straight. <laughs> Is what you said... Uh, but thank you, everybody, for a wonderful year of 2020 on the on the online uh, uh, situation there. All right, Brian, is this your show? No, thankfully. This is yours. Oh, this is my show. Well, fuck, what are we going to do? I just talked about some things we were going to do. I haven't, I haven't got them here in front of me. Here, oh, oh, wait a minute. I just saw this on the TV news. One of my old hometowns, Johnson City, Tennessee. Do you know what they're doing now in John? You've been to Johnson City, Tennessee, Brian. Last you've been to Freedom Hall. There, you've seen some of the Smoky Mountain events. It's a wonderful little mountain town. Do you know what they're doing now in Johnson City? I don't know. They in Johnson City, Tennessee, not New York, not Los Angeles, not Detroit, not the places you see on the news. Johnson City, Tennessee, is so overrun with COVID-related mortalities fatalities, whatever, that they are bringing in refrigerated freezer trucks that they're ready to stack the bodies in because they've run out of space. Not in New York, but in Johnson City, Tennessee. And the woman, w w one of the healthcare of, of personnel, was saying, we are literally telling these people that they have covid and while they're struggling to breathe, they're telling us, no, it's all bullshit. There's no COVID's not real as we are about to intubate them. And and then they realize as we're about to do that, then they're like, oh, shit. And more don't come off of those than do come off. Hence is where the refrigerated trucks come in. But now the healthcare officials are saying it's a predominantly pro-Trump area that voted for President Trump, and now because President Trump has downplayed since the start of the whole thing how serious this is, we got a bunch of people coming in here that we're about to tell, hey, guess what? You're going to die, and they don't believe us because it's not real. And people got mad and started calling the hospitals when, when it was just reported that the, the reason why these big refrigerated trucks was headed over to the hospital was to be a as they said, yeah, we're gonna use them as a temporary morgue because we don't we're about not to have any more space. And people were calling the hospital and yelling at them, saying it was a publicity stunt and it wasn't real. They're backing up rider trucks to put dead bodies in at the hospital, and these dumb shits are calling the hospitals, well, it's not real. You're doing this as a publicity stunt. And meanwhile, the guy that caused all this, I just want to remind everybody, guy that caused all this and so much more that we've had to deal with over the last four years is spending all of his time while everybody's dying and shit, uh, sc still squealing, I won, and trying to get all the Republicans to go along with him to overturn the election because he won, because he couldn't have lost because he's not a loser. And all those that are going along with him, some are, need to be the next ones unelected. I just want to remind everybody about that. And a good place, all of our old friends down in Georgia, Georgia on my mind, uh, we got two chances, slim and none probably, to elect two Democrats in the state of Georgia because there's still a lot of fucking chicken fucking cousins kissing going on down there. 
But if you could find it in your heart, state of Georgia, to give us the two senators that we need to have the Senate and the House and the president starting in January, then maybe something will be done and people will stop dying and being thrown in refrigerated fucking rental trucks. Uh, but I, Brian, I don't know about you, but I'm, I haven't been saying a lot about it because I'm not holding out a lot of hope that the overall, I know there's a lot of wonderful people in the state of Georgia, but it's like Kentucky overall, the fucking goofs rule the day because a few educated cities can't make up for the Hooterville countryside. So I don't think we're going to get two democratic senators, but that would be a wonderful thing from the state of Georgia, just to kick old fucking president pig shit in the ass on the way out after he's wiped his feet on all these dead people and is spending all of his time golfing and squealing about an election that he lost overwhelmingly. Yeah. I don't know if Georgia's going to go completely blue now, but it's certainly on that trajectory for the near future. And, uh, I, I hope it does happen now. If for no other reason, than Purdue and Loeffler are both complete crooked <laughs> Idiot. I saw her I saw her in that debate the other night. What a moron she is. And they're both doing illegal stock trades. They're both rich white crooks that are stupid and don't know anything about what the fuck they're supposed to be doing in, in government. They're just rich fucking white fucks that got there because they prey on stupid poor white fucks. <sighs> anyway, so uh, my thoughts out to all of my old friends in Johnson City. Try to stay out of the refrigerated trucks. But is that, uh, you know, you can't, you have to feel sorry for some of these people. I'm just going to say this one more time, then we'll move on. But you have to feel sorry for some of these people because maybe it's, it's not all just regular stupid people. It's old gullible people, senior citizens. Maybe they're not with it anymore. They think that, you know... Republicans are their party, right? And they've been told this, and now the last thing that they hear from the doctor is, well, besides the fact that you're about to die, uh, you've been lied to all year. So there's that. That's, you know, somebody ought to just take him out, strap him up against a wall, and just let people line up and just spit on him and slap him in the face. He's like Frank Morell used to say about Fred Ward's nephew, Ralph Freed, Rooster. Rooster wasn't the kind of guy you wanted to beat up. He was the kind of guy you just wanted to slap down and piss on in front of the boys. That's the president we've had. Anyway, on a more positive note, did you see it was in the news? It was on uh, Renee. Well, now her, her, her former, her slave name was Renee Young, right? But now her name she's allowed to use is Renee Paquette. Correct? The other name she could use is Renee Good. She's married to John Moxley and his last name is Good. There's there's all kinds of lines if, if I'd have been able to prepare about how good that John may be and et cetera. But but Renee Renee good. I you know, this should be Renee great. Renee fine. I don't know. Anyway. I didn't know you were, I didn't know you were such a fan. She's better than he is. <laughs> I've said that many times. She's natural. She she actually she was most of these young ladies. B I M B O and Bimbo were their names. Oh, oh, come on! Are Stop just it. standing there because they look good. It's the sable effect. They look good in a still shot, and they've got the large upper frontal protuberances, and they've spent five hours in makeup, and they robotically, in a Stepford wife fashion, ask a pre-concocted question to get a completely different response, and they don't speak again. There's no interaction whatsoever. Renee Young actually acted like a female. Sports analyst you would see on CBS, on basketball, or on wh whatever the case, you know, the sports network, whatever. So, and she definitely seems to have a better grip on the business than her husband because she's usually worried about him when he's sticking thumbtacks in his head or bashing himself with some blunt instrument. But anyway, she's got a podcast, apparently, which CM Punk was on. And I was teased into... Uh, watching this clip uh, by the provocative title, CM Punk reveals what it would take to bring him back into wrestling. Uh, well, I want to hear this myself. And it, it would listen to it. It was not. And by the way, he and he sang good. He has a good morning song. He sings to his dog and he had his dog there with him and sang it to him. So already Punk is, is more over with me than most people in the business these days. But anyway, it it wasn't a revelatory 
uh, statement uh, or, uh, you know, a big shocking occurrence, what he said, and that he said, well, it would it, basically boiling it down. I'm not trying to spoil it, but it would take a shitload of money and something that he was interested in doing. Well, I guess what it boils down to, that's kind of obvious, but it was, it was, so it was not a revelation in that respect, but it was revelatory in that again, a, the son of a billionaire with a national cable television show just got in the wrestling business and made a bunch of indie guys that never had it and never will as happy as schoolgirls with shiny new vibrators. But CM Punk can't get happy? He can't make CM Punk happy? Nobody can think of an idea that CM Punk would be interested in that would intrigue him enough to get involved in this. The, 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 if there's a fish out there that has the, the Goldilocks and the three bears combination of not too hot, not too cold, just right between, has he been on TV recently and been beaten into powder or been portrayed in a negative light so that we are now trying to take a guy and make him into a top star? Or he, is he the guy that's been off TV for so long that really, well, you know, we don't know what the fuck's going on with him. He probably can't hang physically with these younger guys. Or is he the icon from 30 years ago that they bring back and make all the current guys look bad? Because even though the icon can't get in the ring and can't go anymore, uh, he's still more over and a bigger star than the rest of their roster. He doesn't fit any of those. He's the right combination. He was a huge star in the biggest company in the world just several years ago, not 30. He wasn't on the bad TV that that same company has done over the last couple of years to where everybody's sick to fucking death of seeing him. His foray into MMA didn't go well in terms of one loss record, but it showed that at least he was going to, if he was going to commit to something, he was going to follow it through. But now the bad taste, if any, in anybody's mind is kind of off of that. He can still go physically in the ring because anybody that was fighting in, in the professionally in the UFC just a couple of years ago, I'm sure he's still in pretty good shape. Everybody knows who the fuck he is. And he would probably, here's a key thing, he would probably be palatable to the people who like anything but the WWE because he was so anti-WWE, the pipe bomb, telling off Triple H, leaving on his own terms. And he's indie at heart, but at the same time, he's not going to go out there and have some goofy indie garbage match like everybody else would be having because he's smart enough to know that he can be a serious main event player in a serious promotion, and he would demand that his shit, he would be dealing with stars and connect with people. He's the fish, he's the big fish, and the, the, the fuck, okay. After you got Jericho and you got Dean Ambrose, tell me anybody else on that roster that could even, I'm not, I'm not saying that their reaction was as good as, as what CM Punk's might be, but tell me anybody else on that roster that could, in terms of star power, in terms of name recognition, in terms of still being young enough to go in this generation, but from a previous bigger generation, the whole nine yards, who else they got? Why wouldn't they have gone there? I think AEW tried to go there, and I think CM Punk, from what I heard, he didn't think very much of their attempt to negotiate via text message, and I don't know how Well, that's serious... what I'm saying. Yeah. You just, you're telling me that all these other guys on this fucking roster that are, are getting paid five or ten times as much as anybody else ever paid them to wrestle or do anything else. Just because the, the the guy in charge of giving out the money had no idea what the financials of wrestling actually were and or what the fuck he was buying into. And unfortunately, his advisors apparently weren't honest with him in that regard. But you can't tell me that you can't. The guy just said for a shit ton of money and something interesting to do, you can't. You're a you're a billionaire. And you've got a wrestling company on national television and you can't fulfill those two things for a guy like CM Punk, but you can somehow 
get pockets and the entire dwarf dong sucker family to come to terms just just like that. She buddy. Uh. Mm. Tell me somebody else they can get right now that's not under contract to the evil empire that would shake things up like that one name, CM Punk. That's not under contract. Kevin Nash. No, I'm kidding. Um <laughs> Okay, and let me. There let me, aren't let too me, many guys. Let me limit this to wrestlers they can sign that can actually wrestle, that can have matches. Who would be a bigger get? I don't know if there is a bigger get. Right, I mean, The Rock. I don't okay, think okay that that okay, and that is possible in this dimension. Yeah. And somebody out there is going to say, well, I said that about Sting. No, I can assure you, the Rocky, if the Rocky ain't going to wrestle for Vince, the Rocky going to wrestle. Although, I mean, you know, I don't know. If Turner wanted to get involved. No. I'm, I'm guaranteed. And I, say, hey, I, we're going we're gonna to buy the rights to one of your sh shows, or we're going to do a whole month of movies of the rock movies for guys no, who no, don't want to no, watch no, movies no. He's anymore. He's got networks buying his shows. And besides, it, it put this down. Tell old Jay Sharknado to write this down. Make note of this in the editing process. I want this clip ready to be brought back up. If The Rock ever appears, wrestles, or, or even appears on the television of AEW opposite Vince McMahon for any reason, I will nail my balls to a step stool on Broadway in Louisville, Kentucky. But just to be clear, you're not saying... Against WWE, you're saying against Vince McMahon. Well, it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. If Vince dies tomorrow, is Rocky still beholden to WWE? Oh, <laughs> well, now you, you goddamn, now you got me scared for my balls. Um, I'm scared for the city of Louisville. Well, as 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 well, you should be. I I don't think just. I think The Rock would still consider the WWE, even after Vince is gone, the premier organization. I don't think that he would ever want to do something for a secondary company at this point. If if he does anything else, wrestles ever again, it'll probably be to put Roman Reigns over. Just And, and obviously, I think everybody understands why that The Rock can pick all anything that he wants to do in life from here on out. So... It wouldn't be like, well, Tony Khan will give him $50 million. I don't think he gives a fuck about $50 million if it, if it wasn't something The Rock wanted to do. Let me ask you this, going back to Punk. Let's just say Tony got a raise in his allowance, and he had even more money to play with, enough money that that's not the issue with getting Punk. So let's say Punk says, okay, you know, the money, no problem, that's good. Then it becomes based around the idea of something interesting, something he would want to do. He, I'm sure, I don't know how much he watches, is aware of the booking of this television show and yeah. this promotion. If he even entertained it because of the money, should he insist on creative control? Well, another thing he said in this interview was, she said, um, she asked him, well, what, what kind of thing would that be in some, some way or another? I can't remember exact words, but the thing he would be interested in. And he said, well, I don't know. He said, that's, that's not my job to come up with. It's sort of like. So he doesn't want creative control, then. That's interesting. Well, no, too. but no, he didn't, I, he didn't say that. He said, I didn't say, I don't want creative control. He said, that's not my job to come up with. And I think he's considering it like, well, somebody should have an idea on how to use me, which. He's gotten very used to people pitching projects to him. Is see well. Here's the thing. Also, if it was me, and and a wrestling promotion called me, I would want to hear that they had at least put enough thought. Even if I was going to change every single fucking thing about it, which I probably would, but I would only tweak things. I wouldn't. Goddamn, they wouldn't start out with a chicken dinner, and I wouldn't turn it into fucking seafood. But I would want them to have thought about something and put thought into something that I specifically would be needed for not that bring in a manager or bring in a guy or bring in a heel or whatever, but no, we need Jim Cornette or we need CM Punk. Having said that, I think he'd be the same way. If, if they, if they came to him with something that was half-assed serious and legitimate 
and that they'd put thought into, even if it was kind of fucked up, if he was into the concept of working with so-and-so, X guy, I don't know who that would be, then he would probably come back and say, well, no, what, what about if we did this and change it up and blah, 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 and do his own thing to it? Which, if he's smart, because he's seen that, you know, these guys are amateurs. And one thing, he, he took pretty good care of himself that last little run there. He was smart enough, too. Um, so I think he'd probably, he knows better than anybody, just like any top guy knows better than anybody, how to get himself over or something that he would do or should be involved in. And that's when you sit down and work shit out with guys. And we've talked about so what Pat Patterson was so good at is sitting down and just letting guys work out their own shit, but putting it in the right place or in the right order or in the right context or whatever. But uh, I just, uh, it, uh, how would you use them in AEW? Good Lord. Off the top of my head. Um, you're bringing them in. I'm not saying I'd, book out the next three years, but you're bringing them in. I'd give I'd give him a baseball bat. Just tell him, go clean out the locker room. Come back and let me know. Uh, no, he, well, that's, here's the thing. And what I was going to say before you hit me with that question, how would I do it is who would he want to, or who should he work with in AEW? I think the only person he mentioned, oh, there's so many people I worked with. I worked with Omega or the Bucks or whatever. It would have to be Cody. Because it would need to be a serious deal. It would need to be something that people could fucking follow and understand. And at the same time, the the verbal performances would have to be believable. That's what it is right there. Because he yeah. can point out how preposterous Cody is. And he could also say, when you guys were starting this, I'm the guy that you texted that you wanted to bring in here. And I didn't want anything to do with this. And now I'm here and I'm going to take a bunch of money. And I'm going to do what I want to do. And they can cut promos back and forth every week. And it'll be fantastic. Yeah. But, and, but also not even with that, not even with Plus that he work this, a similar style. Not that Cody's the greatest in the ring, but I don't know about the young yeah. bucks with CM Punk. I don't know how no, that would work. See, that's, that's the thing that <laughs> that is why th there's, there's such schizophrenic matches, which we'll talk about in the review of the program, uh, such schizophrenic matches, because you know, they got all the gymnasts so that Olivier and the Bucks could have somebody to, to do the play matches with. But those can't be money matches. And whenever somebody like FTR tries to do that shit, it just looks fucking rotten. But with, with it, it, that's why I say with Punk, the verbal performances, regardless of which tack they took with it as far as I was there, blah, 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 what you just said, which was probably better and more thought than they've given it in a year and a half. But just verbally, whatever it was, you you would be able to believe that these guys were serious, that they're somewhat stars, that they, that they're they, they would be able to have a match that would tear the house down psychologically. The people could follow past Cody Jericho athletically. Ain't there anymore. No, I would, and I would he, stay away from that. Yeah, completely. plus he wants to be too witty now, and you don't want... See, I'm you know, doing bad comedy. That defeats the Exactly. Yeah. You don't want CM Punk coming in and being one of the boys and being silly. And, and also, since everybody knows that Cody's an EVP or whatever, there could be the fucking deal where he's kind of taking the, the company's side. That's, That's a good angle that, right there, though. But that's saying that that Cody could figure out a way to to fucking fully make himself the full baby face and let Punk be the full heel. I bet you Punk would probably enjoy being the heel and coming in and telling what he thinks about a lot of people in that company. He comes in there, he starts cutting promos, just telling the truth about how this sucks and this sucks and the owner of this company has his son spending money like a drunken sailor. I decided I'm going to come here and take it. You build up the natural rivalry with him and Cody. They have a match. Winner gets the EVP title. Punk wins because, you know, Dusty's kid has to lose before his big comeback. <laughs> and then Punk's the executive vice president. And, you know, he gets to kind of do things in a more uh, Discord Records kind of way, a more punk rock kind of way, <laughs> shaking things up with Twinkle Toes and the Bucks. Uh, that would be good. I guess we're probably never going to see that, though, because they need to they need to sign another Bulgarian brute that dresses in Versace. Well. To be fair, 
I will say, I think it's ridiculous, and this is not how I would use Rusev or Miro, but having spent a good deal of time in Brighton Beach in my life, he is dressing a little bit more like these Eastern European guys who come over here too, I have to say. <laughs> I mean, he looks ridiculous, but some of them look ridiculous. <laughs> some of them look ridiculous. Uh, well, I'll tell you one thing. Here's what almost nobody in the AEW locker room has to worry about, folks, and that's shaving their balls. Well, that that's was a transition. The, there's a transition for you because the first fruits of puberty have not quite sprouted yet on most of these young men. But I know that we got a pretty hairy audience. So for the hirsute listening to me now in the cult of Cornette, you know what you're going to want for Christmas and for New Year's. You're going to want some nookie. You're closed up in the house. It's cold in most of the country. We've been through a pandemic. Your significant other is probably so starved for sexual attention now, she'll even give you some. So prepare for this now with the fine products from our friends at Manscaped. Because Manscaped is here to give you the perfect package 3.0 that has all the right tools for the job. If you've ever wanted a perfect package, folks, here it is. The Lawnmower 3.0, the Nick Proof Trimmer, has the LED light. It's waterproof. You can, in the twinkling of an eye, take uh, all of the forest down, whack all the weeds, leave everything nice and slick. Also, the Crop Preserver, the anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. You put deodorant on your armpits. Why are you not putting deodorant down there in the middle of Woolly Swamp? Also, the Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray, all of the goods that keep you smelling good and slick and smooth and just as warm and comfortable as a baby's little tummy. And they'll even throw in on this Perfect Package 3.0 a shed travel bag and the anti-chafing boxer briefs. You notice a pattern here, Brian. They want to keep chafing away from your crotchal area. Folks, you won't want to miss this for the holidays. Jingle balls, jingle balls, slick shaved all the way with manscaped. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> oh, what fun it is to shave Mr. Johnson and his friends today. Hey. Oh, my God. Go to manscaped.com <laughs> and get 20% off and free shipping with the code JCE. You can't find this kind of thing anywhere else except right here, folks. I don't know what it is, but you can't find it. 20% off and free shipping with the code JCE at manscaped.com. Happy New Year to the little fellas. Jingle balls, jingle balls, slick shaved all the way. Oh, what fun it is to shave your little balls today. Hey! Is this a Cornet original? Or is I this... don't, well, I, you know, that actually was an old... Uh, uh, Rogers and Hart tune from a musical in the forties. <laughs> I, I can't remember. Anyway, I've got some things. I got some emails here. We might talk about this might bring up some scintillating discussion. I don't know. It might fall flatter than a plate full of piss. We'll find out. But I got a couple of emails, Brian, from a couple of the listeners, obviously. If they weren't listening. They wouldn't send us the emails. And the first one, I thought this is worth bringing up because there's a couple of different takes on the same kind of thing fred writes dear brian and jim he put you first i don't know why i was one of those people who watched the wednesday night show so that i could enjoy your reviews more when i heard them the aggravation associated with doing so now leaves me with less enjoyment as i listen to your reviews without having watched the shows but it was a sacrifice i had to make for my mental health as a person who discovered pro wrestling in 1973 when I left UHF Channel 47 on after roller derby one week, I can't help but pine for those glory days, which in my eye had already started deteriorating by the mid-80s, and he is correct. Looking at your review of AEW last week through these 70s eyes, I find the following examples of dichotomy within what ostensibly should be the same entertainment form remarkable. He has two things he's comparing. Number one. <laughs> what? what? I understood what he was saying there. Yes. I'm, I wasn't fucking breaking it down for you. I was, he didn't enumerate 
in the in the sentence that I just read, I find the following examples of dichotomy within what ostensibly should be the same entertainment form remarkable. He didn't enumerate. Okay. So I said he has two two things that he's comparing here. Two. You jump all over me. Ponderous. Number one. Will Hobbs' one-week face run prior to his heel turn versus Ole Anderson's 12-month pseudo-face run that was simply a ruse to set up his hated adversary. And two, Cody promoting the fact that he is office versus guys like Vern Gagne, who no doubt went to elaborate extremes to kayfabe his position, realizing that if it ever became public knowledge, the concept of he as top babyface would be discounted and downright mocked. And Fred closes with thinking back to roller derby and what pro wrestling was versus is now, I am left with another 70s memory, this one musical. It's better to burn out than it is to rust. You know, Vern was more than content with being the biggest star, owning the territory, and letting Wally Carbo take all the heat. Uh, good and bad. Let Wally Carbo be the face of the company. Exactly. Cody wants people to know that he's an executive. These guys all want people to know that they're executive. Well, I was about to say, don't single him out. No, no, it's no. Not like the other ones are shying away from it. And it also, it was the it was on purpose that Tony Khan was proud to announce this, which. It, it makes no sense to announce wrestlers as part owners and or executives of the promotion that they are wrestling in because then well wouldn't you know who won the pony but they were proud of it because they never tried to give the impression of credibility to begin with they're very proud that they got health insurance and the other guys didn't <laughs> uh, but anyway but that's uh, not only that but the the biggest thing was as we mentioned, Will Hobbs had, what, one match on television and, and two or three saves, one that he was late on and the danger had already passed uh, as a baby face. And they did, they did a package. They talked about him nice for a couple weeks. He had a match, and suddenly his heel turn is, uh, oh, my God, this shocking incident. Ole switched baby face. Stayed baby went through multiple babyface programs with different people as his partners against other heels that he cycled in and out, but never teamed up with or had interaction with Dusty for as as the famous Probo went over a year, and then finally he asked me. He asked me to be his <laughs> partner, and they pulled the trigger on a thing and only switching boom, and there you go. And Dusty didn't look stupid. The guy had been trustworthy to every single one of Dusty's friends without hint of, you know, a, a backstabbishness for over a year. The people were cheering only the wrestling fans in Georgia. They loved him because he was a fucking great psychologist. So he could, as long as he was beating up evil Russians and other, you know, fucking dastardly heels, the grumpy old man was a wonderful baby face. But it, 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 <laughs> it, it I love baby face only, by the way. Yes, it, it's so and he was a fun smart ass, and it was it was good, yeah. <laughs> but that's the thing is they spent time with it because they knew that well, there's no reason to do it if it's not going to get over, and if you just do things every couple of weeks, they don't get over. They understood the the things were not these guys on these programs because they've seen these things on television or they've heard about them or they've been told stories in a locker room or I remember when I did or whatever. They they do they they do things they do moments they do incidents but they do them in such a rushed fashion or without the proper people in place or the fact that the guy wasn't over to begin with because he was so new and they assume that everybody watches their TV every week or that that they have time to and that brings them down to their most hardcore devoted audience other people have things that they need to do in their lives, and they might miss the show every once in a while, which is why you reinforce things without just have taking a step forward every week. Sometimes you pause and let people catch up and reinforce what's already been done. And over a period of... I mean, the period that it takes to get a guy over is has never been longer in the business, and the period that's actually devoted to that has never been shorter. 
In the 70s, in the territory days, the rule of thumb with the promoters was you get TV in a market, you run TV for 12 weeks, then you run your first house show. Well, fuck, 12 weeks, now nobody even knows you're alive. It used to be there was only three or four stations in a market. Now there's hundreds. Uh, as Ring of Honor found out, they were on Sinclair for quite a while before they started picking up new followers. Uh, not only that, but as far as a wrestler, you used to be able to bring a guy in to the territories and give him wins on TV for four to six weeks every week and let him talk, and then boom, you put him in main events. Now it's six weeks. Nobody knows he's alive yet. You can bring some guys in every once in a while and make a big impact. But if you bring everybody in with the idea of making an impact at the start of their run then and their debut, then you're making no impact because you're doing something splashy with everybody. A lot of times you just need to bring somebody in and put them on TV and put them in a paint them in a, a positive light and get them over and get them wins. And nobody gets that anymore. But that's the way to get out. So... Whereas it used to be quick, but the promoters would take their time. Now it's fucking takes longer than ever, and the promoters rush everything. So, boom. Here's a second email. Well, hold and, on. I want to just say because... Okay. The, it's the same kind of thing, well, but the, go ahead. On the topic of Will Hobbs and everything you said is right, another example from the same feud, Cody confronts Taz, and that's when all of a sudden we get this reveal that Taz's son is training with Cody. Oh, yeah. Did you see and then the kid right away is back with Taz. There was no, like, weeks long of, I wanted my son back or anything. It was just all of a sudden, he walked back to the back with his dad. And that was it. Now he's part of Team Taz. And in a backstage pre-tape this week, there's, see, you see who's back? You're the guy that we never knew until last week was gone. <laughs> Oh fuck! And that's uh, see they've seen these things, but it's it's Russo, it's Russo hitting somebody with a coconut because he he saw Snuggit. He don't know what led up to it. He don't know what happened afterwards. But the second email, we're still going to be on the same subject. This is just kind of phrasing it a different way. Um, this is from Dude Saint John. If that is indeed his real name, I would advise any of you not look him up in the DMV records under that name. One of the things I find personally most annoying about modern wrestling is the fact that everyone now has to do signature poses during their matches and entrances, making every match and entrance look like the equivalent of modern dance. Strangely, although these things make wrestling more theatrical and stagey than ever, almost none of the modern wrestlers, with the exception of a few obvious ones, are actually able to act convincingly. Whether it's not looking hurt, not looking intense, not looking scared, or even not looking confident, modern wrestling is a buffet of bad acting which caters to every possible taste. It does seem... <laughs> it does seem like during the cocaine era, many high-profile talents had help with their confidence and intensity, as well as the ability to suspend disbelief. However, wrestling had convincing acting before drug use was so widespread, so that can't be the only reason. Actually, it was it was it was most of the time a help if the guys weren't on cocaine yet because the interviews were better because they made more sense. It, 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 it. Anyway, uh, Jim and Brian, what do the two of you think is the reason for the fact that almost nobody in wrestling can now act convincingly? Could it be that once people stop treating wrestling like it's real, they stop being able to act that way as well? Same thing as, as the other email is just from the different direction. The, the way that the guys are presented now and, and the things are rushed and you're supposed to already know what's going on because everybody's on the internet and everybody watches our show on YouTube and everybody reads the you know uh, uh, websites. But also the guys come out presenting themselves as if they're playing a part rather than being who they're supposed to be. And they're not very good at playing the parts they're playing because they're trying to play a part rather than, I mean, some of them, as we've talked about, Brian, don't have a personality of any kind and need to be dispatched forthwith to the uh, uh, dung heap. But some of the guys that do have personalities can't show them because they're going out and doing this 
prepackaged, choreographed, scripted fucking drama, right? Well, I, I think there's a few issues there. One, uh, the one at the top, I completely agree. I hate the fact that everyone and w, this is WWE's fault. Everyone has to come out and immediately do a pose on the stage, like it's a dance competition, like it's gymnastics. Honestly, like a, it's like a floor routine of gymnastics. <laughs> you come out, you go to one of the areas of the platform, and you do some pose that's unique to you. It's just so stupid. I hate it. But. As far as acting, I'll just talk about in-ring acting. I won't even talk about acting on the promos. And I think that's an industry-wide problem to the point where if anyone is remotely good, it stands out like a sore thumb. But just even the in-ring acting, I think the problem is guys don't have ring time. Uh, you know, I just did a 605 Pat Patterson special. And Pat Patterson, I think everyone agrees, he took off in San Francisco. By the time he got to San Francisco, he was working the Boston area for Tony Santos. Lots of small shows all over the place. Went to Portland underneath. Worked shows all the time. He was working shows, if not every night, almost every night. And then he got to San Francisco and he was ready. There are a lot of and guys... And that had been five or six years. There are a lot of guys on AEW who you see in there and you really don't know what they have. Like Brian Pillman Jr., I don't know what he can do, because how often does he work? Once a week, at most? Yeah. Is he working more than that? When indies are all up and running, does he work shows that are not just weekends? And I'm using him as an example. I'm not well, and, and, and I, can, I can testify to that, uh, that no, those guys, when indies were up and running before the pandemic, they were working three or four times a week. But the problem is, they're all working with each other. The students are... are the students in a lot of cases, teach each other in wrestling now. Because when they're working indie shows, they're working with other guys that are struggling to get somewhere the same as they are. And that's been a rule of thumb in the wrestling business for as long as I've been around it. You don't get better working with people that are, have the same or less experience and skill level as you. You get better working with better people, which is why I always blister the top guys that have experience and have been somewhere when they come in and try to have the kids match, prove that they're cool rather than the kids having their match to learn something. But yet, yeah, that's the point is now they're only working once a, once a week or whatever, but even then, working four times a week wasn't the, the boon that you would think it would have been because it wasn't in the territories where you had to be in the locker rooms with veterans and you had to be in the ring with veterans or whether it wasn't a, an organized training program, at least for good or bad, like NXT or like OVW. Or a few that they that have been set up where you you were exposed to and and in the ring with guys that were way ahead of you, so you, you that can't even be. So you're right. The point is they don't have enough ring time. But even when they were working, they weren't getting ring time they needed. They're getting they were getting practice and <laughs> students teaching each other in anything is like fucking, you know, you're just, you're left alone in study hall and you get to cheat off each other's paper. But if the problem is nobody's there to tell you whether it's the right or wrong answer. And the other thing I think is the crowds, because let's say you're an indie guy and you're working four times a week. Let's say you're that lucky. You're working four times a week. How different are those crowds? And are you yeah. working to see what works to a crowd and what gets a reaction? Or are you working a match that you have pre-planned in your head that you're going to work again the next time you work and the next time you work, as opposed to, oh, wow, this got a reaction tonight from this crowd. I think I'm going to try this again. Uh, we'll work in the next town. Like, that's the thing, too. A lot of these guys, it just feels like going through the motions isn't the right term because it's not like they're not trying hard or putting a lot of passion they're, in all they're the They're trying too they're hard. Yeah. But, but here's, a, here's another thing on your point just a second ago, what works for the crowd. Here's the thing. You're doing an indie show. The crowd that's there, if you're doing shit to to pop them, it's probably shit that you shouldn't be doing because it's an indie crowd that went to see that specific shit, and it's 200 of them. And the first thing that if you ever got on national TV with somebody responsible in charge of a company, that's the first thing they tell you is don't do any of the shit, probably that was popping those 200 people because most of it was probably insane. So the, uh, that's... With, uh, that's why I, uh, to be honest, I tried to keep our towns, our crowds, the fans here in OVW appreciative of the most basic stuff and the 
just keep the fans fans of pro wrestling as as what it was rather than what they've turned it into because then guys could actually learn then guys could actually do what you were talking about because it was like being an audience in front of the territories in those days and then that was applicable to stuff that they would later need to know in the WWE or if they were in a big, big league promotion somewhere because they'd worked in front of regular fans. If we'd have had the indie fans that went to the outlaw shows over in Indiana with no commission or the garbage death shows that, you know, they put on around here, none of our guys would have learned anything either. We would have produced the same kind of guys as they've got right now. A bunch of fucking indie stooges doing indie level shit all the time. So part of that is the the audience that you're working for. They're in a catch-22. They have to work indie shows to get experience, but when they work indie shows, they're working for the people that have come to see a fucking indie show, and they want to see all the shit that you shouldn't be doing because they're not real wrestling fans. So, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. But I, I do take exception to dude's comment about during the cocaine era, the ability to suspend disbelief and to have confidence or intensity or whatever, even either in the match or in your promo or whatever, is not is not dependent on drugs. And as I said, a lot of times I saw some of the guys probably would have made a little bit more sense if they hadn't been on the drugs, but they would have still come off as real and credible. And that's because the, they got started in the business where the people that broke them in and the people that taught them and the people that employed them and the people that they looked up to all said, the first thing you do is invest everything you've got in making people believe that you are serious, that you mean what you say or that you're going to do what you're doing or that you are who are you are supposed to be. Nobody said, oh, I've gotten wrestling to do this spectacular move. And I bet you I could come off the top and do this with the thing. And no, it was you. Who are you? Why are you here? What's your gimmick? We didn't say character. What's your gimmick and get the shit over. And that's the way they went about it. So it was a completely different approach. But I think the one thing everybody can universally agree on is about me, whether they like me or not, is that I didn't often give an interview where you didn't legitimately believe that I believed what I was saying. Would that be a fair statement? Yeah, and I think when it comes to the word acting, using that in this context, that's the other problem, is that a lot of these guys, on their promos... They're acting. Th that They're trying to act. They're trying to act. It's not acting, it's reacting. Wrestling is reacting. What's happening to you? How would you react to it? And what would you say if it was fucking real and you were you? And that's all it is. So people are trying to act are already off kilter. But at a point I was going to make is cocaine had nothing to do with my uh, believability or convincingness. I can take pride in the fact that I've never been imp impaired in any fashion before I was gave a promo or did a match or any other thing in, in the line of wrestling. But it made Roddy but Piper must see. Well, yeah, but, but still, you all, you always knew more about what Roddy was talking about if he wasn't on the shit. <laughs> but anyway, that's the point. It's, it, the guys could look at it like that again, but they're not taught how. They're not instructed how. They don't, they don't have the mentorship. And, and plus, they see monkey see, monkey do this shit on television where people are being rewarded for trying to, you know, be actors instead of wrestlers. And, and uh, you know, so... Well, also, uh, it's the objectives. Because, you know, and again, this is where WWE created an industry-wide problem by handing people scripts and telling people what to say and being really strict about that. They tried to script Dusty Rhodes, you know what I mean? Like, they, this is a WWE problem, but beyond that, guys in let's say the 60s, 70s, 80s, into the 90s, but primarily those three decades, they had an objective, which was, I have to go out there and either convince people to pay to see me kick someone's ass or convince people that they want to pay to see someone kick my ass. Right. If you didn't do that, if you weren't able to do that, you weren't going to go as far as your talent in the ring may take you. Tim Horner, to use him as an example, was really good in the ring. You go back and you watch his stuff, he was great. Especially by today's standards. You can't listen to him on the mic. No. 
And that's the thing. There was an objective and that, that caused him, well, other reasons too, but that caused his career to peak at a certain point. He couldn't get past that because he couldn't talk. You needed to be able to do that. That was part of the trade. That was part of what made you desirable to a territory. And, and also nobody was going to write some shit out and hand it to you and expect you to recite it. The booker was going to tell you what he wanted you to talk about. And if you went out there and talked about it in a bland, un boring and unconvincing fashion, you weren't going to get a lot of other opportunities to speak on television. And nobody that didn't speak on television was featured in money matches. Hey, real quick. I'm curious. Like when you went to mid South, because Jim Cornette in Mid-South is different than Jim Cornette in Memphis. When you go to Mid-South and Weasel Dooley seeing these tapes, is he thinking, or does he say to you, yep, that's the Jim I know, or is he thinking, <laughs> where did that come from? Where did you learn how to start doing promos like that? Like, What was someone who knew you for so long thinking? Well, it, it wasn't just, it wasn't really different then the last six months of me in Memphis, it's just the last six months of me in Memphis, there was almost nothing on tape because they weren't using me. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Think about that. That's true. Whatever, you know, when, when, when I got started, they used me pretty good in November, December, January, February, March, April, and then boom, changing bookers, Lawler took over, featured Jimmy Hart more. I went to Georgia. When I went to Georgia, despite the fact that we were, you know, holding our events in a fucking mud puddle, uh, I was the only manager on the show. And I was the one that was supposed to do the interviews to draw whatever money there was going to be drawn on the heel side of things. And I managed, except for Dundee, who was the top single heel, I managed every other heel, all four of them, right? And that's when I had to be more serious and get more information out in the promo and the more focus was on me. So that was kind of a dry, it was like a rehearsal in front of a few people for mid South. And then when I went back to Memphis, they just weren't using me where I got a chance to talk very much at all, but I still had kind of got the idea in my head and we were riding in a car with Dundee and Frank Morrell and those guys. Um, so it, when I finally went to Louisiana, now it's, it's real. This is a big time territory. I'm the not only the top manager, but now going to be the only manager. And Watts has already told us he's going to push us to the fucking moon. So I've got to do this shit. And also, we knew from, well, anybody knew, but also then we were instructed a couple of times that Watts had a more serious thing, that Memphis was the studio, crazy, zany. Watts was a little more sports-based, to use a modern phrase. And uh, a little bit more serious. And he also got with me and said, I, I want the mama's boy. You're rich. You look down your nose at people. He brought out every unsavory quality that I might have. If I was too humorous without a, a, a smart ass point to it. And, 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 no, 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 no. Don't be funny. As he told Nikolai Volkov one time, Nikolai was trying to compete and joust with the other heels on the promos right and he started telling some guy a joke butch reed had told and watts said eh, ten thousand comedians out of work nikolai you're a wrestler so you know it, it just it was it was a different atmosphere and you know just a different flavor where you know all the rather than in memphis i was one of the guys and i was out there and trying to make myself noticed but in louisiana it was all on me as far as the being the heel manager and as far as us being the top tag team. So, you know, I had to get my shit together. So back to my question, did Weasel Dooley, someone who knew you oh. before you were in the business as an <laughs> on-air character, was he not surprised or was he surprised no, I, by... I don't, I don't think Weasel was real surprised because, fuck, that's the one thing we'd done in bowling too and all, everybody, we cut promos with each other. Now, th they knew I could, I could, I could cut everybody else's promo. I just had never done a Jim Cornette promo because Jim Cornette wasn't anybody. I could do Lawler. I could do Handsome Jimmy. I could do Funk. I could do everybody else's. I just did, couldn't do a Jim Cornette because there was no Jim Cornette at that point. So I don't know. But again, your objective, you, you could only succeed. If you failed right away, Watts would have moved on and done something different. You had to succeed there. Yeah. Guys don't have yeah. that anymore. There he is was, no he was urgency. Still, he was actually, even <laughs> even after the thing with Magnum and and, uh, and Wrestling 2, the, the program there, 
when, once we got past the last stampede, he told Dundee he was ready to let us go at the end of the last stampede because he said, well, he said, I've, I'm going to have beaten them, you know, embarrassed the manager, juiced both of the heels. They won't have any heat left. And Dundee said, no, nah, but we got the rock and roll coming up. Just And so he kept us and we, you know, shot the deal with the rock and roll right afterwards to come out of the last stampede with the rock and roll and got our heat back and got another eight months out of it or seven months. Brian, you know what I think the problem is with the AEW locker room and, and most of the modern wrestlers is, as Mama Cornette used to have a phrase, son, you're going to have to eat a lot more meat and potatoes before you can whip me. And I think they're not eating enough of their meat and potatoes. And I know, I don't know about potatoes. I think they deal, they deal enough potatoes out, but we can fix them with the meat, can't we? We can certainly fix them with some steaks. We can certainly fix them with some meat. <laughs> <laughs> from from Omaha Steaks, folks. I, as a matter of fact, when we finish this program, which hopefully will be any second now, am going to treat myself with some deluxe gourmet Omaha Steaks burgers that I got in my recent package with some comeback sauce from Martin's Barbecue on top of them. I love that stuff. But anyway, folks, whether it's steaks, whether it's chicken, whether it's burgers, whether it's hot dogs, all kinds of meats, amazing sides, the infamous Omaha Steaks desserts with the Deluxe Grillers assortment, you get it all. Omaha Steaks, butchers cut filet mignons, the whole nine yards. Plus, right now, you can get the Deluxe Grillers assortment plus four free burgers and a free digital meat thermometer so you don't burn these things into shoe leather at an exclusive price available only to my listeners when you go to omahasteaks.com and enter the code JCE into the search bar. Extra burgers and a free meat thermometer. Remember, you don't want to go out and eat even if you can. Indoor dining is closed in most places for good reason. You don't want people slobbering all over you. Omaha Steaks delivers this stuff directly to your door. Packed safely, frozen, Ziploc, vacuum sealed, it's all fresh, comes right to the door, and then you can stick it in the freezer and bring it out whenever you want. And uh, did I mention that I am incredibly fond of the potatoes au gratin as my sides, whereas Stacy likes those apple turnover things that are so good, and you just pop it in the oven and boom. And with the meat thermometer... You know exactly when these things are done just the way you like them. And, of course, Brian, with your filet mignon habit, you mainline that shit three times a week, right? I have really become a fan of the burgers, too. Well, but you don't eat cheese on your burger. No, of course not. Well, we're going to talk about that at another time. Or you can go to YouTube, folks. But right now, if you want some steaks, turn your house into a steakhouse for the holidays or send somebody you love or somebody that you want to suck up to their own package of Omaha Steaks. Go to omahasteaks.com, enter the code JCE in the search bar, shop the gourmet grill packs, and get a special price. What more can we do? We're feeding America here. You know who's not feeding America? Who's that? NXT. Oof. They're starving us. We are starved for the sight of real men. I've, again, it was schizophrenic today. You want to talk about NXT for a minute? This was the show I from don't. December 9th. I well, really we're, go, we're going I to really just don't. for a minute. But here that it's gotten to the point where there's there's not even like a good segment and a bad segment, but there's like there's high points in a segment and then low points in the same segment, and it goes back and forth. Um, they opened the show with a package on the men's war games. And then Finn Balor, the NXT champion, came out. He's been out. He's had the broken jaw. We, we're, we're, we're fans of Finn Balor. He's a good-looking athlete. He works hard. He's serious. He barely gets the idea out of his mouth that he's issuing a challenge to anybody in the back of music hits and interrupts him already. Have you noticed this a pattern with everything is rushed? You can't even... Get, <laughs> If a guy was waiting just for, he better not say one thing about me or I'm going to go out there. They don't even wait for the one thing. They're just out, right? It is Pete Dunn. He's the first one out. He's less orange. He still has weird hair. But this is what, it's, I can't even concentrate on what they're doing because the presentation is so by rote and just obviously 
pre-planned setup. Balor comes out, mugs for the camera, then talks for just a second. The music hits. Dunn walks out. That's where I said it was like a hostage statement. He waits for the music to drop. Then with no energy, he recites what he's got to say. Then Kyle O'Reilly's music plays. But at least when he was coming down, he interrupted his music. He had a flow, a verbal cadence. He was more natural, a little bit of a smart ass. It was still written shit, but it sounded better. But then they're interrupted by Damian Priest, who is an actual star waiting to happen if they'd ever give him any help. And he comes down, they're all bickering about who's going to get a shot at Balor. But then did you notice Dunn and Balor and Kyle, they start trying to do a bit with each other. And it got awkward. They're mocking each other and Balor just walks off and leaves. Them. And I'm sure in, in concept, in rehearsal, maybe this was just exciting, but it was just blah, because they're obviously doing a bit while the guy walks off. And then uh, from the stage, he announces that he'll defend the NXT championship on January 6th at New Year's Evil. I guess we know what we're going to be doing. But Regal can pick the challenger. Well, after they've got... He's barely said anything. He was interrupted by these guys who came out and said some scripted setup stuff. Then he walks off and he says, well, I'll let Regal pick the challenger. And that was kind of flat. And here comes Scarlet out and walks circles around Balor. And Balor tells her off, kind of, but not really. It wasn't like, you, your pussy stinks, you bitch. It was like, man. And then he, that was flat. But then Scarlet's still standing there. At least Priest bows up her at, a, at her a little bit. Says, hey, do you leave your boyfriend in the car? Tell him to come up to me if he wants a fucking fight. At this point, and then Scarlet just looked, and then she walked off. At this point, I was dizzy and bored at the same time. There was so many people talking, interacting with so many other people about so much shit that it was hard to keep track, but at the same time, none of it sounded intriguing or interesting. It was all obviously set up, but no one was given the chance or supplied with the verbiage or the okay to just go into business for themselves and make any of this interesting before somebody or something else jumped in and took it in a different direction. That's what I saw. What'd you think? I thought this was junior varsity raw. <laughs> this was a raw opening segment. One guy's in the ring and then the music hits and yeah. another person comes out. He didn't do it yet, but we already know what'll happen. William Regal will come out and announce a multi-person match with the winner getting a title shot at New Year's Evil. I can't wait. I just, I, I'm, I've said it before, I'm not a big fan of the whole, the music hits, the person comes out, the music hits, another person comes out. The only part I liked was Kyle O'Reilly briefly putting on a British accent to make fun of me. <laughs> that was the one part of the little yeah. skit that I did think was kind of funny. But otherwise... This was Monday Night Raw. This was NXT turning into Raw. And NXT used to be good. NXT's really bad right now. Not saying that there aren't talented guys there, but... Say, we're only in seg one. Save it. You're, you're going to need that verbiage for, you know, seg five. The booking is so awful. And just just awful. Just This is terrible. I hate this show. You're going to get me all fired up, right? Well, just, just calm down. Drink a bowl of Valium Soup over there and think about this for a second. Because here's... I'm just going to ask you some questions. Oh, great. Because we go to the back. Pete Dunn is walking out, is stopped by the interviewer and asked a question. Immediately, Killian Dane runs through the door, sees Dunn, piles on him. He's got a bunch of people trying to pull him off. Boom, boom, boom. They are, in a two-hour show, they are on the backstage or out in the parking lot or somewhere in the hallway interviewer camera guy for, for what, a t let, total of less than five minutes on each one of these two-hour shows. But yet, every week during that time, two or three different attacks, will surprise attacks, will take place on this backstage interviewer camera. Can you imagine how many there are that don't accidentally happen when they're on the camera, when they're on that shot live? There must be 25 to 50 people being attacked at random in the back for them to be lucky enough to catch two or three of these attacks per week on TV. It dry, it's driving me slowly fucking out of my mind. Yeah, and we'll talk about that with AEW when we get to that review. But, you know, I thought oh, about, yeah, we can count those. I thought about Mid South Wrestling when 
Remember, Mr. Wrestling 2 was being stalked. They didn't know who was doing it. Someone put a doll with a noose around its neck in his bag. Someone put a mask with writing all over it in his bag. Didn't know who was doing it. Then one day during the show, it's revealed that there's some kind of confrontation up in the locker room. And of course, as you know, the locker room was up a flight of stairs or a couple flights of stairs. In the well, it was one stairs. long, one double or triple length flight of stairs. All of a sudden, out of the dressing room door, we see Mr. Olympia backing off from Mr. Wrestling 2 and kind of being walked backwards down the stairs as Wrestling 2 yells at him, lets him know that he's got his suitcase. We didn't actually see the moment in the locker room. Like, hey, what's this? And it was better that way, because why would there be a camera there in the locker room filming all that? <laughs> but it's just nonstop behind-the-scenes stuff. By the way, Killian Dane. Maybe I missed something because I skipped most of his matches. I don't know why he had a problem with Pete Dunn. No, I, I do. I can tell you that because uh, Dunn slammed his head in something. Wasn't it? He got knocked him out, slammed his head in the door, something, did something to him. I don't Maybe. But then all of a sudden he attacks Pete Dunn and all of a sudden Birch and Lorcan are right there. Where were they? Where what, Were the cameras filming Dunn walk out? They were right next to the cameraman? <laughs> where the hell were they? All right, anyway. A hot ang a hot backstage segment to set up a match that nobody wants to see. I just think they should hire a lot more security back there because there's a lot of people being physically assaulted. That's against the law. Uh the next match was J Tony Atlas, Jake Atlas against uh Swerve Scott and I uh, exercised the I don't care rule. Cuz we've talked about it Jake Atlas boring I zipped ahead of the finish. He won with a badly reversed roll-up. Swerve's shoulders weren't down. I don't know whether that was to lead to a rematch or just because they applied the hold awkwardly. Uh, did you have any thoughts on this match before we move on? No. Okay. Champa was up next. Champa doing a pre-taped. He looked like he was in Moxley's warehouse, but it was lit better. Did you notice that? At least when they when they do something... With one of their talents in a warehouse on NXT, they get the lighting guy in, give it a nice little look. Uh, it, it was a good promo about his match with Cameron Grimes coming up, which I'm looking forward to in this program. Uh, it's it, Tommaso Ciampa sounds like Tommaso Ciampa saying what he would say. And he delivers it well, and he's got a good fucking look. I, you know, we repeat this every week because it bears repeating. Um, but it, it was a pre-tape. The next match was a triple threat tag team match, which they announced right as the guys were getting into it was no count out and no disqualification. And they jump started it with a six way with Drake and Gibson, the grizzly young veterinarians and ever ready, the battery people and Marcel Marceau and Fabian Forte. And the last thing that I wanted to see was a triple threat tag team match between middle card guys with no count out, no disqualification that starts with a six way. So I fast forward it. What did I miss? Nothing. Okay. The next thing. <laughs> and now I'm going to put something over the package on the war games, not the one they did at the top of the program, but the one with, they did not only the men's, but the women's war games and comments from everybody involved. It looked like dog shit when they were doing it. We talked about it, especially the women's match with the fake sledgehammer that they were hitting each other with and then getting back up and the chairs and the tables and poor girls got hurt and blah, blah, blah. But this is the magic of uh, editing and highlights. When you can take just the pieces and you can avoid the obvious phoniness of the setup and the aftermath when somebody gets right back up and just show those clips and the comments from everybody. This is the kind of package that will get future war games matches over as really more dangerous than any other match, which they apparently are, especially the way they're doing them these days. But the package it made, it made the shit that didn't look good when it was actually done look more real in the, in the editing and the comments and everybody was serious. This, to me, got the War Games match over as same way Roy Shire used to do with the Battle Royals in San Francisco. Somebody's going to get hurt. This is chaos. We're going to put 
importance on this. So this package was a great job and everybody involved in it, which is why I don't understand. They do serious so well. And and they they even do believable so well when they when they try. But I like the package. Your thoughts? I don't care. <laughs> they blew it with war games. God damn it. I am trying now as best I can. This show sucks. This show sucks. On this, this, on this show sucks. This this show sucks. At least AEW, it's so ADD, they just throw everything they can into every segment, and there's lots of shit, but it keeps moving. This show's like in slow motion at times. I don't care what they show about the War Games. The War Games wasn't good. They ruined what War Games is. They made it dumb. They made War Games the same as every other match where they bring in tons of stupid weapons. If I ever see another fucking kendo stick, it'll be too soon. Well, we're about to later on in this program. <laughs> you know I'm right. You know I'm right. This show sucks. God, what what was that? What was that movie, that Disney movie where Lindsay Lohan, before she became a cum gargling slut, played like it got switched uh, personalities with somebody? Well, it's, it's, it's happened Friday. to us. It happened before Lindsay Lohan. It was a remake. There you, well, there you. Well, you know, nevertheless. But you know. For everyone out there, and I used to watch NXT, for everyone out there that's like, oh, one day Triple H will take over and things will be better. Look at this show. Does this show give you any hope? It's JV Raw. It's horrible. What was next? Well, Tony Storm was in the back doing an interview. Like her look, she's very well-spoken, very good interview. And then Io Shirai comes in and attacks her. <laughs> And they go to fight. Of course, why shouldn't she? Why and wouldn't she? Why wouldn't she? And they have a shitty backstage fight into the arena and into the ring. <laughs> you you've seen those shitty backstage fights? And they go into the ring, and EO beat her up, and she bailed out, and then Ember Moon glommed her from behind and threw her back in, Tony Storm, I mean, and EO Moon salted her. So we have two baby faces leaving one heel laying. Boy, that shows her. It, but uh, another attack that was, you know, basically if you're in if you're in the back at an NXT show, you are in serious danger. Sheedy backstage fight. And then suddenly. It was Tommaso Ciampa versus Cameron Grimes, and holy shit, a wrestling match with men broke out. I couldn't believe grown adults. Nice and snug, good energy. Timothy Thatcher comes out, sets a chair down, watches at ringside. Ciampa and Grimes get pissed at each other and pick up the pace a little bit and get into a nice fight. And then they go to break. Of course, one match on this program so far I've wanted to see, they go right to the break, but Grimes got heat on Champa, and it, this was competitive. It, I will put Grimes over now. This was the best match I maybe have seen him in just because he could actually be serious here, and it was competitive with a top main event guy, and old Grimes can work, and I like him when he's being serious and not freaking out at zombie referees. Uh, Champa made a big comeback, clotheslined him the shit out of him, but then Grimes get that flipping cross body for a false finish, which was nice. And then suddenly a stooge jumps up on the apron. It's, it's uh, whatever the name was of, of Thatcher's student and Champa nails him and grabs him, but the referee tells him, let him go. So he turns around and Grimes kicks Champa from behind, boom, in the head, chucks him out on the floor. Champa rolls back in, Grimes jumps out, Grimes tries to jump back in and Champa hits the DDT on him, his draping DDT, boom, one, two, three. Good match. Cameron Grimes was great just wrestling, and then suddenly that finish out of nowhere just sucked fucking pond water. Even if it, it, and then Champa and Thatcher do the stare down, but Grimes and Champa walks off. Grimes yells at Thatcher in an overly stagey way, so they go back to phony Cameron Grimes, and then Thatcher takes him down and just yanks his leg, and Cameron sells it like he's been hit by a car. So we we. Ended on over the top phony after all of that. I I don't I don't know what to say. It was all right, and like you said, I'm I'm happy to see Cameron Grimes work a match, but then he goes right back to the to the silliness afterwards. And I 
That's the one part of his whole deal that I don't like. He could obviously do silly, and that goes a far away in the WWE. <laughs> but I don't like him doing it. I think he's really talented and really good. And I don't think he needs to. But that's that's all I have to say. <sighs> well, I, your favorite part of the show came up next. Because you secretly, you have been a fan of wrestling for a long time, Brian Last, but I know what you have an even larger collection of, and that is Bolivian snuff films and Chinese torture videos. I, and for, this the, for the record, that's not true. Just want to make sure I put that out there. And this week's Chinese torture video, you know, the Germans do these a little better, but I must say I like the lighting coming from the Chinese. What the fuck? The, did you notice the poor guys, Boa and Shia? Uh, Boa is the guy. He's getting the shit beat out of him, but the girl is having to is having to just punch and kick shit. And then they, what the fuck is going on here? Can you explain? No, this? no, I can't explain this. I don't know what this is. I'll give the older Chinese man some credit. He's got great production values when he tortures people. Yeah. <laughs> this is a great little package of this torture stuff. I don't know what this is. They waterboarded him last week. Now, this way, for the people who didn't see it, it's these the Chinese guy and girl, Boa and Shia, with the old Chinese master straight out of a Kung Fu episode, and somebody is beating Boa with kendo sticks over and over and the slow-mo looks great you know when they're whacking him and everything but he's getting a shit kicked out of him but they couldn't be actually torturing a female on television so they're making her throw strikes against hard wooden objects kicks and punches until her she's worked her fingers to the bone and you know what you get when you work your fingers to the bone brian bony fingers you get bony fingers you know i feel bad for Zia Lee and boa because they're being tortured by this guy and then in the middle of it, they're probably like, oh, no, he's bringing a camera crew in here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want this documented. I don't want my parents to see this. But at least there's evidence for I don't potential know. legal prosecution. <laughs> yeah. I wish what? Stephen P. New was sponsoring this week's Why? episode. <laughs> Perfect transition. Why are they putting up with this? Why don't they go to the authorities <laughs> and put an end to this? You would think at least Child Protective <laughs> Services. Somebody would be interested in finding out this. Uh, because well, it's I on could... NXT, it flies under the radar <laughs> <That's> of <laughs> the authorities, because no one watches this show. Hey, the next time that you're at a rest area in the Orlando area, there's going to be pictures of the NXT wrestlers saying, <laughs> with the human trafficking oh. fucking posters on them. All right. <laughs> now, I've, I'm faced with a conundrum, Brian, because of what the next segment revealed. And Mr. and Mrs. Same Face, Johnny and Candy, the purple pixie and her bland boyfriend, now their stooges in their little their little group are Indy Hartwell and Austin Theory. So now to theoretically, no pun intended, to see Austin Theory, the guy I think should be the next big star in a wrestling business, I have to watch not only the same faces but a wrestler literally named Indy, an indie wrestler in the group. They've made Theory and Indy the stooges for these two whiny, boring, bland, young white people. And the stooges are both a foot taller and 40 pounds heavier and more athletically attractive than the people they're stooging for. And... Somehow, Johnny Sameface can come out and do his best impersonation of The Rock and still not change his facial expression except to open his mouth wider. They did comedy. The whole thing was an overplayed modern wrestling performance, tongue-in-cheek from Johnny Gargano. He is horrible. The fake booze hated him. Uh, they're apparently making Austin Theory an idiot. And yeah, this what the hell was that about? He went on forever and finally revealed a trophy flown in overnight from Italy for candy for winning the women's war games. It was a trophy with Shotzi's head on it. And at that point, I fast forwarded until I saw Damien Priest. And then I stopped because 
Once again, please, when I watch this show, hit me in the head so I can see some stars. So Priest is out there. He's pissed off, obviously, because Theory is the one that hit him in the ghost outfit, hit him with the pipe over the head, and he didn't win the North American title. So Priest comes out, and I love the line. He said, hey, you got your pipe with you? Because I'm fixing to come down here and stick it up your ass. That was great. That was yeah. the best part of the whole thing. Yeah. That was the best part of the show, practically. <laughs> and as he's on the way down there, boom, he gets attacked by Karrion Cross. He's attacked another attack. And, and the, but this time it's two grown men. It looked like they're serious. And he, and, and Cross power bombed Damian Priest off the stage. Uh, so obviously what Priest said to Cross's cohort earlier was taken to heart old scarlet of all the attacks on the show this was the best imagine what kind of impact it might have left if this had been the only one they did just this two hours just the only time somebody gets attacked from behind in one two-hour period could be with your top guys that you're wanting to push just a thought because I, th- I said <laughs> i said before i said Fuck, I, I, it, when we started recording right before we went on, I said, wait a minute, let me check my notes. I can't remember what was on NXT. I only watched it three hours ago. Because I, it, it's just all the same. Anyway, give me your thoughts on the uh, performance of Johnny Same Face here in this. It, it was like from the Al Pacino fucking method acting school here. Oh, no, it wasn't. Uh, he obviously is trying hard to show a personality. He doesn't have one purple hair or whatever's going on there makes her look a lot older than she is um i know i've said it before and i know he has a beard but he kind of looks like hitler he's like (laughs) he's like he's like a hipster hitler he's the hipster hitler and i hate using austin theory as a goof and as a silly guy because he has a ton of potential and he's already pretty good and he's the size of a wrestler and I said last time, I'd love to see him and Damian Priest. And of course, Damian Priest comes out and they have the thing with him and Cross. That, that's all right for what it is. But to go back to my earlier points, NXT was always different than the main roster. And people would say, oh, I can't wait for Triple H to get control of things because it's being done in a different manner. It's not perfect. There are things I still thought weren't done well, but it was closer to the wrestling someone like me liked then WWE under Vince McMahon. This is not that NXT. Again, this is junior varsity raw. That whole segment with the Garganos and doing bad comedy with Hartwell and Austin theory and the stupid trophy. That was raw. It was almost like an audition tape for raw. So I didn't like it. I'm I'm happy that cross is back though. At least may young didn't give birth to the trophy. At least. Yes, I'm glad Cross is back too. What you know, he had just got we liked him and he just got started with that little run and got fucked up. But maybe they let's see if they can keep from hurting him for a while this time. We'll see. Uh Pete Dunn wrestled Killian Dane. Did you see that? I saw that they wrestled, <laughs> but I recognize that I didn't care. Let me, I, let me just, Pete Dunn hit Killian Dane with a move that looked like Killian Dane landed on top of Pete Dunn, but Pete Dunn got the one, two, three. And I'm sorry, I didn't, I wasn't interested. And then we moved to the main event, and guess what the main event was? Raquel Gonzalez versus Ember Moon. I like Raquel Gonzalez. She's big. She's like the female diesel. She's going to overpower all the girls. She did a promo earlier in the show, was very well-spoken, got a good look. I'm not seeing what's going on. Ember Moon, as they used to say in Kentucky back in my childhood, had a, has a real low-slung ass. And she's about a foot shorter than Raquel. And this was the main event. And so I decided that I would skip ahead just a bit to see what happened. And I saw... At one point, I stopped when I saw Ember Moon climbing the lighting truss. And I said, oh boy. So I backed it up, and Ember Moon had hit a dive, dive over the bottom rope. But a dive nevertheless, and it went face first to the floor, but she knocked Raquel over the top of the desk and was going to climb the lighting truss. Apparently, the inference was that she was going to jump off the truss onto Raquel on the table, although the truss was a long way away. I'm not sure what maneuver she was going to 
fucking perpetrate. But nevertheless, as she's climbing it, Raquel Gonzalez grabs Ember Moon's feet, jerks her feet out from under her, so it's like Ember Moon is Vader bombing Raquel Gonzalez, and Gonzalez caught her on her shoulder on the fly, turned around, and speared her. Just lawn darted Ember Moon headfirst into the steel ring post. Is that a fairly accurate representation of what they did? Oh, I don't know. I was still fast forwarding. Okay, well, it's an accurate representation. Speared her into the head first into the post. Boom, rolled her into the ring, covered Ember Moon. One, two, she kicked out. I said, what the fuck? And then I fast forwarded further. And it, during that time, Ember Moon got up, was running. They were doing spots, was perfectly fine. Ember Moon was getting some false finishes. And then Raquel Gonzalez hit one half-ass, kind of shitty-looking wrestling move right after Ember Moon had false finished Raquel and Raquel had barely kicked out. And then Raquel just caught her, kind of got her up, dropped her down, boom, one, two, three. Ah. Uh, Maybe they didn't realize that the catch and the spear into the post was going to look so good, but one would thought would have thought that when they were going over the finish verbally with any producer who's been in wrestling for about 15, 30 minutes, how does, I'm going to throw you head first into a steel ring post, and then I'm going to roll you back in the ring. You're going to kick out. We're going to go another two or three minutes, and then I'm going to beat you with a half-ass fucking move in the ring. How does that get past things? How does that go past everybody? If I was Ember Moon, and this may be the problem, people are not considering when they're talking over their finishes what do I want to get beat by? What if I get, what can I get beat by that still keeps me looking strong or gives me an out or whatever? So if I was Ember Moon, I would have rather have done the job for the head first spear into the steel post when I was caught, when I was on offense and suddenly the worm turned boom and I was knocked goofy like that was something that really looked good rather than surviving that going competitively for two or three more minutes, almost getting a win, and then the girl just picks me up and drops me on my head out of nowhere and beats me flat one, two, three. I'd rather not do that second one. I'd rather do the first one. Nobody knows how to lose anymore. Ah, so then uh, uh, Storm came in and started to get to beat up Ember Moon, but here came Rhea Ripley and pulled Ember Moon out, got in to confront Raquel Gonzalez, and Raquel backed out, and they left. And that was it. There was no, it's breaking down in Orlando. She just kind of walked off. There you have it. That was the program. Man, you know, these Wednesday nights, one show, we've said it before, AEW is being run by someone who seemingly has ADD, who hot shots every segment. This other show is in a coma. <laughs> the main event was Raquel Gonzalez versus Ember Moon. This was the main event on this show. This awful, awful two hours of wrestling. Like I said, I don't blame the wrestlers. There are some really talented people there. But NXT right now is a garbage show and needs something to shake it up. Bad. Just bad. Just, oh. It's like, it's hard to get through. I don't want to fast forward segments. <laughs> they're making you you don't want to do i don't it. want to. i really see don't what you made him do. see what you made him do nxt i don't see what you made brian do brian's not really like that you make him do these things hey i don't fast forward through segments on aew there's even the segments i don't like i watch no. them well that's because you're expecting somebody to be dropped on their head or something really stupid to go on because there's a high probability of either one of those but still i don't fast forward with nxt there's stuff that I just say, there's no way I'm watching this. There's no way I'm watching Killian Dane versus Pete Dunne. I don't care. There's no way I'm watching Ember Moon versus Raquel Gonzalez in the main event of a show against another show that has Sting and Shaq. Well, they, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, we, I mean, we, we didn't get much of, we may have got a lot of Sting, but we didn't get much of a Shaq my attack. Point we'll is, get to that in a minute. My point is, if NXT's senior management has given up, why shouldn't I give up? This show is not good. 
They need to do something completely different. Instead of just doing a bunch of bad shows leading into their big show, whether it's a takeover or New Year's Evil, and then his last takeover sucked. We'll see how New Year's Evil is. And the fake crowd noise. Boy, both shows, <laughs> both shows are guilty of this. And AEW, they really have a lot of sound issues, but especially with the fake crowd. But NXT, it's so bad. When you hear people chanting something or clapping their hands, and you look, and there's no one in the building clapping their hands, and no one even on the screens clapping their hands. I still say, this is in all seriousness, if they could figure out a way to have sound from the fans that are in the virtual Thunderdome on those little pictures, if their sound could be there, so you're getting a, a visual and an audio response at the same time, that would work. But this fucking fake canned sound that they're doing it 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 takes over the show in some cases i mean some of these heels i think the fucking fake booze are gonna riot somebody may get stabbed <laughs> when, I, I when, when watching this show i wish it was me <laughs> well that's why I, I know exactly what you need brian for when nxt is on you need to have the tv sitting there so you can kind of watch it and then you need to look over to the left of your desk and see that beautiful skylight frame. That's what you need to see, the skylight frame with pictures of all of your loved one. That's right. You, no, wait, various hold on. times of your life, No. various moments from when you were on a bearskin rug, when you had your first uh, 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 school play, when you had your first little baseball game, when you had your first little suppository all of your childhood, <laughs> and your high school and graduation, and when your parents kicked you out of the house and then when your first girlfriend kicked you out of the house and all these what times you through your life, right there on your skylight frame, folks, if you have moments or times in your life or places you've been or people in your family that you want to keep near and dear to your heart, you get the skylight frames. We've been talking about these. You set it up. It sets up in under a minute. You plug it in. You use the touch screen, connect to the wireless network, and boom, people can email you pictures to this frame, multiple pictures, multiple people. You can slide show it. You can swipe through them with your finger. You can thank the people who sent the pictures. It's 100% satisfaction guaranteed. If you don't love the Skylight frame, they give you a full refund. You can either preload it with pictures and give it as a gift, or you can Get it for yourself and your family in your own home and have everybody sending you pictures. The significant other, the spouse, the grandparent, the grandchild. And we've talked about the incredible potential there is for candid photography with something like this for folks who are quarantined and who have that type of relationship with their significant other. Whether it's mama crying tears of joy for when you, she gets one of these for Christmas or her birthday or whether it's daddy crying because he got pictures of mama. One way or another. Skylightframe.com. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E. Skylightframe. How in the world else would you spell it? Dot com. Promo code DRIVE and get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame. 10 bucks off a Skylight Frame with the code DRIVE, D-R-I-V-E, at skylightframe.com. You cannot beat that. And these things, and you never get bored looking at it. Well, I know you never get bored looking at pictures of yourself anyway, Brian, but you don't get bored because you can always change the pictures instantly in the twinkling of an eye. For the record, I have pictures of my beautiful family, my beautiful Swami, as well as various members of the New York Mets. You're, wait, wait, you have Mets pictures in your skylight frame. Maybe Jacob deGrom, John Olerud, Keith Hernandez, Tom Seaver, Jerry Kuzman, Tommy Agee, Cleon Jones, Gary Carter, Daryl Strawberry, Dwight Gooden, Rick Reed, Todd Hunley. I can keep going. Do you want me to keep going? Mike Piazza. Good Lord. You need help, son. All right. As better as a matter of fact, when you when you do your pro, your other programs on the Arcadian Vanguard Network, do you sit there and and harass your other on air talent and hosts and people you do bit like you do me with all these things? No. What are you doing this week in the world of your other programs? 
another fine week of programming on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter, at Super Podcasts, or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. All shows guaranteed to be better than NXT and available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. A few notes. This week, on Pro Wrestling Spotlight, then and now with myself and John Arezzi, where we go back and review the original broadcast of Pro Wrestling Spotlight from 30 years ago, we have an episode that everyone will be talking about. Paul E. Dangerously in the studio for two hours, completely out of control, doing commercial reads, yelling at listeners, in one case going at it with one of the listeners' mothers. There's a lot going on here. <laughs> hey, a very entertaining I time. Woman, I hope that wasn't, wasn't, woman wasn't close or tough, or elsewise, Paul E. might have had a problem. Well, this is a very memorable episode. Of course, you can hear the entire two-hour episode on Patreon, patreon.com slash Arezzi. But you hear our review with audio from the original episode at pwspod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. It is out later this weekend. Also, speaking of shows out later this weekend, the latest episode of the Mid-South Wrestling Television Review Podcast with myself and Mike Mills out this weekend. We are right now in the fall of 1983, a very dark time in Mid-South Wrestling before things really pick up with the emergence of Bill Dundee as Booker and all the great talent coming over from Memphis, including Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express. Why were these guys necessary in this territory? Well, if, you, if you've looked at fall of 1983, you'll find out. Find out as we review the fall of 1983 at MidSouthPod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! You shall rue this day. But go on, start ruing! Yeah. Fuck your fucking science fiction kaleidoscope there. This thing is great. The latest episode, the Pat Patterson tribute episode out now. We talk about Pat's long and historic career as a wrestler, as well as as a creative force. Talking about his partnerships with Ray Stevens, as well as his out of the ring partnership with Louis Dondero. And of course, his creative partnership with Vince McMahon. All of that and so much more. A great history lesson for all at 605pod.com. Available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The Mothership. Yeah, I always think mother something whenever I hear it. Anyway, um, before we talk about the other program, there was a wild card thrown into things this week. Don Callis uh, 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 brokered the, the whole thing with Olivier and AEW and everything, and... They did a crossover. Olivier appeared on Impact Wrestling. I did not watch this program because, as everyone knows, there is an Impact rule here at the castle since they <laughs> shot and killed the guy on his wedding, or they didn't kill him. They just shot him and did a murder mystery. Uh, I don't do, I will not watch Impact Wrestling. I will not validate their offensive efforts at wrestling with my credibility. However, there was a part of impact that was kind of technically was the commercial part. So I, I didn't watch the show cause this was a commercial on the show, but it was with Tony Khan and Tony Schiavone, the two Tonys doing a, a paid advertisement for AEW that was placed in the body of impact wrestling. Did I describe that fairly accurately? That's the way they portrayed it. I think so. And they were standing up in front of the old, in front of the old Crockett interview set, the blue, you know, with AEW, whatever on it. And it was a three minute stand up with Tony Khan doing, uh, crossing back and forth from being kind of a heel or maybe not a heel, just a dick and kind of knocking impact and putting AEW over, but not really while Tony Schiavone stood there like he was kind of doing one of these with a fan at a convention and he'd already done 52 of them and he didn't really want to be there. And so he just said a word every now and then. And at one point he mentioned that he did spend what had was appeared for impact one night and then quit the business for 18 years. 
Uh, but I encourage everybody to see this. It's on YouTube. Normally, I don't, you know, promote other people's product. You got to see this, whether it's Impact or AEW or Tony Khan or whatever. You got to see this. The WWE may do silly and phony and stupid, but they don't do amateur. And this was amateur. Like I said, Tony, like he was doing a thing with a fan at a convention, and Tony Khan trying to be a some type of television personality. Then Tony Schiavone said it was 25 years since he last talked to Sting. He didn't talk to him the last six years of WCW? What did you make of this whole thing? Uh, and, and that's why they could have used Don West. If somebody just... Don West could have made this stand up somewhat entertaining because, as we've mentioned, it looked like it was on the Home Shopping Network. Well, I was very happy about the segment because, although not a gambling man, I did place a small wager with a friend of mine that Tony Khan would be an on-air character by the end of 2020. <laughs> and I won that bet, which is why I took that bet, because I knew I would win that bet. I mean, this is, like you said, I know there are people who worship AEW who loved it, but I thought amateur is probably the best way to put it. Tony Khan looks ridiculous out there as the head of AEW. You know, I think beyond the actual content, what I find stupid is the fact that as soon as they did the angle last week where Don Callis ran away with Kenny Omega, everyone involved did interviews talking about how they set this up, how they're working together, how, you know, why they're working together. <laughs> and then all of a sudden we're supposed to pretend we didn't hear all that. So now it's basically, you guys know this is all an act. Play along. Nah, that's all right. You know, I got better things to do with my life. And, uh, yeah, no, I just <sighs> thought it was, it's silly. I mean, it's, it's at this point he is playing, it's like Vince McMahon being a heel in Memphis. I finally could be a heel. You know, Tony Khan Except gets Except he did it well. He did it well, but the point is it's Tony Khan being able to be a heel, and he can't do it on his own show. So he's doing it on their show, but he's an on-air character, so I want to bet. <laughs> well, speaking of winning By the way, bet. my next bet is that he's going to be sleeping with one of the women that's working for him within the next year and a half. So, well, 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 it was a year and a half when I made the bet. By the end of 2021, the other part of the bet was he will all of a sudden find out that he's in love with one of his female wrestlers. So Greg, we'll the office boy went the other way. He went with a rat in Detroit. <laughs> what? He, he couldn't get any of the, the girls on the roster, but he broke up his first marriage over a rat in Detroit. Are you serious? As a heart attack. He, I forgot he was, you guys were running Detroit. Fuck, he went to Detroit one time. He wasn't even a fucking show. <laughs> 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 they get around the business and all of a sudden they they've never been able to get well i guess tony's probably been able to get women with his father's bank account but people guys that have never been able to get women and they see all the shit going around around wrestling and they've never been able to be on tv and they see all the shit it, it happens to every single one of them anyway um this television program uh aew from december 9th opened with guess who the middle-aged bucks in their long-awaited grudge match with Evans and Angelico. And, of course, there was the obligatory pre-tape of backstage the Bucks talking bad, our uh, pie-faced Buck, old uh, Buck Hogan, being a badass while balding Buck stood there and chewed gum because he was all out of ass-kicking. Uh, there was a... Basically, this match was set up because this team who's never been on their fucking television show but like once suddenly came out last week had a fucking match jumped these guys and now boom they're on tv with the champions and they came to the ring and it was a four-way jump start and a four-way to the floor and the heels huddled up to catch the guys when they dove and it was every no talent ever having every indie match ever as i said a team that's never even on tv much less one on tv out of nowhere jumps the champions in the back last attacks them in the back now has a long TV match where they do everything ever seen in the ring and the Bucks win. This is what their deal is. And that's so I fast forwarded this because it looked the same thing as every or the same as every other young Bucks match, and it was set up the same way. Did I miss something? 
Well, you're a little wrong. It wasn't a long match where they did everything. It was a 13-minute match where they did everything. They threw everything in there, and they kicked out of everything. And like you said, it was every Bucks match. And there were several points where there were guys just standing around waiting for someone to jump on them. I'm not a big fan of their style. I'm sure if you are, you probably love this match. But it was just nonstop. You know, some may call them spot monkeys, <laughs> but it was just nonstop spots kicking out. I of everything. really think, you know, it's been proven with scientific testing that monkeys are intelligent and can be trained. So I think it's really disrespectful and, and inaccurate to call them spot monkeys because these guys have shown that they are not that smart and can't be trained. Now, with this match, and I got to say, I was a little disappointed we didn't get the passionless and Helico dancing this week. After I talked about how much I get a kick out of it, he didn't do it because they rushed through the match. There was no entrance for these guys. Yeah, they had to jump start it real quick. So this ties into something I said last week where I said it seems like after every match they have to do something. There's some angle after every single match. And boy, did they kick that up a notch this week. So after this match, what was their name? The Ascension? The Acclaimed. The Acclaimed who we just met last week, they were sitting at ringside, they jumped the rail and did nothing because SCU is suddenly the protectors of the Young Bucks, probably because the Young Bucks gave them jobs. They scared them off. But it began a trend throughout the night where, you know, NXT, shit takes forever. And it just happens. Here, everything happens and there's an angle and let's rush to the back, there's something else happening, another angle. <laughs> And then let's get back to the match. A million things. Everyone kicks out everything, and boom, there's an angle. Uh. And I think I think also <laughs> you're you're in you're in bigger trouble if you're in NXT if you're in the in the back. Yes. Whereas unless AEW, you're a female, unless you're a female, unless you're a female. But if 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 you're in AEW and you win a match, you're fucked because they're they're going to kick your ass immediately afterwards. It's every match. I mean, I said it last week, and going into this week, I paid attention to it. Let's see if they do it. It's every single match, every single segment, they hot shot. Every single segment has someone on the other side of the rail wanting to get involved or someone running in to attack someone. It's every match. This is bad booking. Well, that's because that's, uh, I can hear the, the mark. <laughs> now I can hear the mark coming out of people when they say, well, that's because Everything keeps moving and everything ties in and everybody's always having a confrontation and this is good television. No, it's fucking noise and nobody remembers because it's all the same. But that's the way that they convince themselves. That's the way that the amateur bookers and amateur wrestling fans and armchair, you know, uh, uh, critics say that that's supposed to be done because they've listened to shit stains fucking shoot interviews. So they've learned from the best. Anyway, I will say and... In no way am I comparing Tony Khan to Vince Russo. But this felt like that frenetic energy of the Crash TV era. Just nonstop things happening to the point where who cares? It wasn't just the Crash TV era. Remember, he helped uh, Impact go from a million and a half viewers a week to what do they got now? 250,000 yeah. with a hot shot. Uh, but uh, remember that four scene 32 man brawl to lead us into the top of the second hour that he did one time down there anyway uh darby allen is now seeing a psychiatrist and boy does this shit write itself except did you see the psychiatrist he looked like one of donald trump's doctors the psychiatrist looked like he needed to be analyzed you couldn't take this serious. Well, it was on a soundstage. Of course you couldn't take it well, seriously. Well, I, I was, I was, that's why I stopped myself. You couldn't take this seriously. And I was like, well, what the fuck? They're shooting this for television like it's a real goddamn analysis session. But he showed the doctor, Dr. Vinny Boom Bots, is showing Darby ink blots, pictures, sketches, whatever it's supposed to be. What do you see? And of course, he sees all the people he's mad at. However, we finally, in all these things, what have I been saying? We don't, we never hear Darby Allen speak. We don't hear his voice. We don't hear what he sounds like, what he talks like, what he thinks, what his viewpoint is. We, he's just mute all the time in these things. So finally, we hear him talk, and he read a spooky statement that I'm sure he had written in somewhat of a monotone voice, in a voiceover, and still didn't actually just speak. 
And so this, it was obviously phony from the start, but kind of contrived and not as exciting as, but why, why can this guy not be exciting? Why does he have to be moping around all the time? Like he's ready to cut his fucking throat. Why is he so miserable? Do I want to like a miserable person? I'm a miserable person. Even I'm fun loving every once in a while. I'll fucking tell a ball shaven joke. He never smiles. He never speaks. He's miserable all the time. And all he wants to do is hurt himself. Why do I want to be around this guy at this point? He's got tons of fucking charisma and athletic ability. But why is anybody supposed to fucking like him? Help me. I don't have an answer for that. Was the MJF promo before or after this? It's after. Okay. Because Cody did his entrance next. <laughs> to come out and speak to Tony Schiavone, who was dressed like he was at his kid's football game in cold weather. Why aren't they even trying like they're professional announcers anymore? And, and yes, they're outdoors in Florida. And now where it was hot, it now it's 40 degrees or whatever. I don't give a fuck. As Frank Morell told me at a goddamn very hot fucking rec center in North Georgia in 1983, when I said, hey, you think I should wear my jacket out there? It's awful hot. He said, if it's too hot to wear your gimmick, it's too hot to work. And since then, if it's too hot or too cold, I still wore my fucking gimmick. Wear a goddamn suit, announcers, for fuck's sake. Look professional, even if the program you're on doesn't give you any backup in that respect. So Tony asks an awkward question of Cody. And before Cody utters a word, blackout, winter video, music, video, <laughs> snow, it sting. When did snow become part of stings? It did. When, when <laughs> I guess Tony Khan watches the Game of Thrones. And as we all know, winter's coming. I've quit watching the Game of Thrones four seasons ago. You know why? Because it was too many people in it, too hard to keep track of who was on whose side, and too long in between seasons. I'm beginning to see what Tony Khan might be a fan of. And it, it also, by the way, somebody, somebody tweeted, well, all Cornette did was bury Sting when talking about... And I, I I wrote back, I said, I guess you missed the part about where I said, I'm not knocking Sting here and I've always liked him, but <sighs> the blue light and the snow makes him look even more gray haired than he may be right now. And he's not doing the full, full on, you know, Wahoo McDaniel, Bill Dundee type of jet black die job. But he comes in the ring, Arn bows out for no reason. They're they're building this or they're talking about, well, Arn Anderson and Sting had no love for each other. Yeah. Cause one was in the horseman and one was the baby face, but that was 25 years ago. And we actually now theoretically have Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson on opposite sides of the fence, but they still don't fight with each other. But Arn bows out just so that Sting and Cody can be there all alone in the ring. Because then Tony tries to bow out, but Sting immediately breaks the tension by hugging Tony and turning it into a cheerful reunion. Did we need the tension broken at that point in time, Brian? Remember what we said last week, I guess on the drive through The biggest point of Sting's career was the point where he didn't talk and he just dropped in and dropped out. Not the point where he was warm and huggable Sting. <laughs> yes. And see, that's what that, some people misinterpreted what I said. They said, well, I said, Sting never loved the business. And somebody said, oh, that's why he was in it for 30 years. No, he was in it for 30 years because people paid him an incredible amount of money to do it from almost the very start. He was never a wrestling fan and he didn't love the business like other people did. That's not a knock. And that's the truth. But as far as what he will be good at on an ongoing basis, his promos were never, he was never in the upper echelon of promo guys. As you said, he did better when he didn't talk or when he said few words or when he just came out and howled and beat his chest. Ah, it's the baby face. They liked that. But it's not like he's going to manage and speak for someone. He pointed at Darby Allen in the bleachers. Okay, that's a natural. The guy with the painted face, the, you know, the, the, uh, fucking, uh, he's a different kind of cat, right? 
except Sting was six foot two and 245 or 50 pounds and built like a bodybuilder and looked like he came off the beach and all the girls wanted to fuck him, whereas Darby Allen is five foot seven and 150 pounds and over there rolling himself off of shelves in body bags and fucking jumping off bridges. And I don't think a lot of people want to fuck him because he does that. Uh, but okay, so he could be the mentor of Darby Allen, but that's only going to go so far. You're going to be able to get a couple of matches if you're careful with him. And I think Cody would be the guy for Sting to work with. He'd be the safest and the best match for the same reason we mentioned that Cody would be the best match with anybody else because he's the one that can actually work. Um, Sting is not a trainer on camera or off. on camera. He could be a trainer off camera. He ain't a trainer. He's not an announcer, but he says he's going to be spending a lot of time around here. And to Cody, he said, see you around, kid. Okay, they're teasing future dissension, but did a lot happen at this point in time, or did did Cody and Sting just talk to each other for a little while? Do we want to see anything more than we did before after this segment? Or because Sting broke the tension and hugged Tony and turned it into cheerful, you know, story time. Do we want to see shit less? Cause I don't understand what happened here. Yeah, I'm not sure. And obviously Sting was the big thing they built up. They didn't build up the Shaq thing until last minute, which probably means they didn't film the Shaq thing until the last minute. But Sting was the one big thing they built up. That and Omega, you know, after whatever he did on Impact. And it was very early in the show. They had him out there. I don't know why Cody has to do his ridiculous entrance for every single appearance but it's more and more obnoxious each time he does it. And then everyone else has to come out of a separate entranceway. <laughs> like Arn Anderson's not with him. Arn Anderson's <sighs> down the pedestrian uh, entranceway. <laughs> yeah. I, he's, he's over. He's, he's not a, for the preferred boarding. He's over there with the marks and the general line. They could do one of two things with Sting. He could either work a match or he won't. If he's going to work a match, it has to be something ultra safe because of his neck issues. And I don't think Cody's the perfect person for that, but I think Cody's probably the best option. I, I don't even know if he's the best option in that company because Dustin may be actually, now that I think about it. But Cody amongst the people who mean something. Well, but then money. Yeah. Then, you know, and, and, and then here's the thing also, if Sting's going to be aligned with Darby Allen, and then Cody, it's all the baby faces fighting amongst each other, which actually makes sense because all the heels here in this company are mad at each other. Yeah, everyone hates everyone on air in AEW. <laughs> it's ridiculous. You're either in a faction, you're either in a gang, or you're... In, it's like warriors. Everyone's in a stupid gang that looks stupid. Meanwhile, we just want to get to Coney Island. Well... But no, I don't know where they're thankfully. going with this. I don't know what... I wouldn't have had Sting come out there hugging people. Yeah, I, I could... <sighs> It was some some intrigue about what's going on from last week when he stared everybody down. He got oh, come on, Tony, give me a hug, bring it in. It's been so long. Based on the rating last week and the rating this week, I wouldn't be surprised if they have Sting on every episode going forward. Well, <laughs> doing the same thing. But yeah. here's one thing I'm happy about: Hook is back where he belongs. They did a Team Taz promo in the back, and surprise, surprise, Taz's son, who has been training with Cody, we found that out last week. Now he's not. He's with them now. Great. We found that out longer than a week ago, didn't we? Was it, a, was it two weeks then? It was a few weeks ago where all of a sudden he announces it, and right away the guy's at ringside to walk back with his dad. What was the point of it? Well, they should tell us these things beforehand, but then that would be giving things away. Now, the MJF promo was before this, I think, wasn't it? No, they were. Hold on here. I'm looking through my goddamn notes here. They are coming up. That's uh, Not they. Uh, I'm, him and Wardlow, the, so, the solo promo they did. I may have missed this then. They did. It was great. And you know why it was great? It was 30 seconds. It was 30 seconds going into a commercial break. It was here, you know, here I am. Here's what I'm going to do. Commercial. And because it wasn't two minutes, it stood out. To me, at least, it was perfect for what it needed to be. Well, I wish seconds. I'd have seen it. <laughs> but I saw too much of it later on. Anyway, let's get to the wrestling match on the program. Um, FTR wrestled the Varsity Blondes, Griff Garrison and Brian Pillman Jr. Brian Pillman's not blonde anymore. Brian Pillman's hair is dark. Why are they the Varsity Blondes? 
Well, because, you see, Tony Khan was a fan of the Varsity Club, and Tony Khan was a fan of the Hollywood Blondes, and Brian Pillman Jr.'s dad was in the Hollywood Blondes for five months or whatever it was. So you combine all those things, all those forces together, and although both guys, their hair is more brown than blonde, they are the Varsity Blondes. Well, they ought to be the Varsity Browns. Or as Bobby Eaton said one time about him and Orville Hutto when they got started out as a tag team when they were both 16 years old, they should have worn yellow tights and brown boots and called them the drizzling shits. Anyway, <laughs> it was 30 minutes into this program before anybody who is actually a professionally trained wrestler was in action when this match started. And FTR immediately... <laughs> It's not even like looking at the same, at guys doing the same endeavor. They pick up the in-ring level of performance through the roof just because of their professionalism and that they're actually trained and they know what they're doing. And they had a good tag match with these guys. They started heat on Pillman to go to the break, come back, still getting the heat on Pillman. Tully gets a cheap shot. First time I've actually seen a manager just interfere in a match because he could. There was uh, uh, definite baby faces and heels to this match. FTR led it, and that's the best. It's best I've seen Brian look. Uh, I haven't seen Griff at all, but he looked good. So, but they the FTR led it well. They rushed the hot tag, or Brian rushed the hot tag. As soon as he got the chance, he just scampered over there. He could have gone to the neutral corner and let the other guy shape, but whatever. They got a rush. Um. Old Griff had a nice comeback. FTR fed it perfectly. At one point, Brian tagged Griff's ass as Griff was going through the ropes. I'm not sure about that, but Dax hit a real nice brain buster. And then they hit their finish. Boom, one, two, three. A good match and a good win. And the underneath baby faces looked more competent for, for the effort than when they go out there and have one of these goofy, stupid, flippy matches with guys that don't know what they're doing. So the guys that did the job came out better. And FTR, this is what they or anyone else in the over one year history of this program now should have had on their debuts and on their builds. Good, solid, exciting wins against guys that they're better than. So that you get the idea that these are the stars and they are winners. But the, this company brings everybody in with no fucking build whatsoever beats them and then starts fucking after they beat them in main events then they start putting them in preliminary matches to get over I, what'd you think about the ftr match i thought it was good it was nice to see them back on tv i don't think we've seen them have a match since they lost the belts uh, i know you brought up tully at ringside i was thinking during this match can you imagine if jim had actually managed these guys the managers here do nothing you know, Tully did an interview where he said, you know, talking about them losing the belts, well, I wasn't there at ringside. I'm like, yeah, well, whenever you are, you don't do anything anyway. Yeah, exactly. But uh, good to see them on TV. It is not his fault. No. Nobody's telling him not to do anything. If, if people are either telling him don't do anything or not telling him do something, what the fuck? I'd go to sleep out there. But I thought it was a good match. Um, first time I've seen Varsity Blondes as a team. Cool that they had matching trunks already i like that in a tag team it's one of the minor reasons why i always liked stan lane and bobby a little better than dennis and bobby well we made a little more money by then too but you know i mean this goes into the whole idea that i wish these guys had a place they could work where it was more than once or twice a week yeah or, or in, in AEW's case i guess it's technically if you're working both nights it's twice in two weeks because we really don't know i mean i know there was one spot where brian pillman got like dropped on his head or his neck and it looked a little stiff. But um, I can't speak too much of it. They, they did fine. FTR was great. Really happy to see them back on the show and hope they do something good with them. Well, you can hope in one hand and shit in the other and see which one fills up first. Um, <laughs> Officer Barb Brady was in, in a bar with Adam Page. And as he starts talking, two of the goofy dork order jobbers stand up from behind the bar like he wouldn't have known that they were there. He, and they made a joke about it. How long you been there? About 10 minutes. And they offered No, no, no. His, I thought they said partners. seven days. I, I, well, I thought it's, it's all about 10 minutes or whatever. I don't fucking know. 
But nevertheless, is a fucking pages in a bar. These two goofs stand up. He's not supposed to have known they were there. They're going to be his partners. Well, maybe just once. What the fuck? Alex now, Marvez is incapable of saying anything that doesn't sound fake. Well, because he has, he doesn't. He's a nice human being. He doesn't need to be anywhere near television except to watch it. He's not an on-camera personality. He never has been. And now he's memorizing these things to say, and he recites them like he's memorized them, like it's a second language to him, and he doesn't know the meaning behind it. He's just fucking saying these sounds. Because that's what somebody sounds like when they're, they shouldn't be on TV, they're not good at it, and they're not comfortable. But that would be another thing they would have to admit that they've made a massive mistake on, so they won't. They, they just keep putting him out there, making him look stupid. And speaking of things that they just will not admit that they've made a drastic error on and just stop it, the dork order. The next match was Dustin versus 10. A masked guy with the Roman numerals for 10 written on his chest in Sharpie. This is national fucking television. And I'm not, I love Dustin Rhodes. He's one of the best workers in the company. I'm not watching 10. So I fast forwarded it and Dustin won with a bulldog. And then because they can't leave anything alone, here comes Pizzeria Uno with the rest of the dork order jobbers and Colt. Colt's the only one you could recognize even if he wasn't wearing a mask. All the rest of them look like miscellaneous dipshits that work at Shaggy's Pizza. With Uno being the fucking daytime manager. Not even the nighttime when he gets real busy. Just the daytime. Why are they still doing this stupid, 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 stupid thing? Brody Lee has disappeared, apparently out of embarrassment. He <laughs> dumbed himself out of the business or he stunk out the joint. I don't know where he's gone. Possibly he's in the mob. They've had to relocate him. Just quit this thing now. Why? And they want Dustin to be seven. Wasn't that his name in WCW? I think they may have done that, didn't they? They yeah. did do something like that. Well, it doesn't matter. It was awful. It was awful then. It is awful now. This was so outlaw bad. And then Dustin slaps fucking Uno, but then he wouldn't let him jump Dustin. And then there's Colt Cabana standing back there in the back of it, collecting a check, smiling like, this is the easiest I ever, gig I ever had. Do nothing. Get paid. You know, we brought up the fact earlier that after every single match, something happened. We almost forgot one. FTR win their match, and all of a sudden, they're going at it with Marco Stunt at ringside. Oh, actually, I'd already, I'd already skipped ahead. When they were doing their, we got our hands up in the air and strutting, I was trying to skip ahead to see if I could get this over with quicker. So I didn't even... It, it's every what, match. What, every would, match. What, would, what would somebody do? What would any of them do? What would old dwarf, dwarf dong sucker do if he got his little banny rooster ass up in somebody's face and they just picked him up over their shoulder and just walked off with him against his will? <laughs> what would he do? Not even beat him up, just walk off with Not him. Not even beat him, just walk off with him. And he'd be <laughs> wailing on him. And then what is he going to do? That's funny. It's a grown man just carrying him away. I think they should do that. Anyway, I was trying to get to the meat of the matter here. I wanted to see the big segment. And the big segment was what came up next. Big, no pun intended there, Brian. I wanted to see what they were going to do with Shaquille O'Neal. And I had been led to believe by what has been on television, previously said that there would be some kind of big whoop to do some kind of come-to-Jesus meeting, some kind of... We're going to fucking sit down here and shuck this ear of corn all the way down to the cob till we get things straight meeting between Shaq and Cody. But instead, we get Tony Schiavone and Shaq in a sit-down with Brandy Rhodes. In a sling, even. Her arm in a sling. Shaq sitting there like he had just recently had a cocktail with Bill Cosby. He was almost comatose. Oh, he couldn't have put any less <laughs> energy in this. And he said he, he had to refer to, well, Brandy starts out being a heel, being snippy, right? And she's sitting there with her arm in a sling from that phony bullshit with old Jane Cargill. And they've actually, Shaq, 
he's had some passing uh, uh, affiliation with wrestling a couple of times in the past. Now, I guess he's watched it on TV, but he probably thinks, well, these are the wrestling people. They know what the fuck I'm supposed to be talking about. I'm sure they told him who this Jade Cargill was, right? Because he says, I'm not a fan of Jade. or No, I am a fan of Jade. But I, like he's a, a fan of, how can he be a fan of someone that no one has ever seen before? Because all the people watching the program are going, well, goddamn, we never seen her until three weeks ago. How can, how can he be a fan of hers? He wants big things to happen for her. I think from her being a college basketball player was my oh, guess. But then he maybe he could have said that. But on this program, he said he's a fan of Jade, but he didn't appreciate what she did to Brandy's arm. And then did you get the impression Shaq and Brandy started building Jade versus Brandy and not Shaq versus Cody? Did you get that? There's a lot to say about this. Segment. He actually even said he and Cody were just messing around on social media, but he, he felt bad about Brandy's arm, but blah, blah, blah. But old Jane or Jade or whatever. The, go ahead and you say anything you want to say about this segment, because I can't believe that they got this fucking guy to do this. And this is what they came up with. You know, when Cody does interviews and he says that they don't believe in the old tropes of the past where you need a baby face or a heel. What I never realized was he was talking about his wife. Because <laughs> she's back and to being a heel. Both. She's both. She's back to being a heel because Shaq wasn't a heel at all. He was just a guy being asked to sit down and talk about someone he apparently knows. He didn't act like a heel. He did nothing to build up a match. Who knew that this whole thing really was to build up Jade, who apparently has not ever wrestled, who's in training right now, Versus Brandy, who I think we could say, even if you are the biggest Brandy fan, you'll admit she does not belong in the ring. She is not a wrestler. She tries, but I appreciate her desire. She's not a wrestler. She's also not a baby face, it turns out, even though she was a few weeks ago defending her husband, cutting the greatest promo of all time. She's back to being a woman that it's impossible to cheer for. She's being a heel. In this sit-down with Shaq, she's hamming it up. He looks like he doesn't give a crap. Except at the end, when she throws the drink in his face, and then he gets comedic. And the camera, the last shot you see is his, like, selling of the water to the face. And, call, and she called him an asshole. This girl came out on TV and said, Oh, yeah, by the way, Cody, I have a man. His name is Shaq. And it led to this. Yeah, and, and he's a giant. So it, it, let's recap. Cody Rhodes comes out on television on his wrestling program and is speaking when suddenly an unknown woman who we have never seen or heard of before or even men got mentioned comes out and interrupts him and spends five minutes trying to get some shit out that nobody knew what the fuck she was talking about and it was fucking rotten. And suddenly she mentions Shaquille O'Neal's name and had some off-brand reason of why the Cody had considered himself a giant, but she knows a real giant, so now they're going to compare dick sizes. But here comes Brandy to chew out this unknown woman verbally, and goddamn, there it is. And then the next week on TV, this unknown woman is standing on Brandy's arm with a chair on it, backstage, and a bunch of people are yelling, and now Brandy's got her arm in a sling. But then... For the last week, it was never even mentioned, and Shaq wasn't mentioned that week, and then suddenly, they announce on social media that Shaquille O'Neal will be on this program, and okay, yes, I understand it's a pandemic, and he's a, a celebrity, and so it's a pre-tape rather than live in the ring or whatever, but my God, my God, has there ever been a flatter use of a celebrity? Has there ever been a more in, inexplicable trail of of incidents that don't go together to get to a point where now nobody's it apparently they have come to the conclusion that Shaquille O'Neal is not going to do dick about anything and Brandy's the one that has a problem so they're helping they're having Shaquille O'Neal shed light on the Brandy and Jane Cargill rivalry now here just off the top <laughs> of my head 
I've promoted a lot of things and I've promoted stuff with local celebrities. You don't do that this way. You don't do any of, of this this way. Some people are going to say, well, maybe they didn't advertise Shaq because they didn't know that he had, they had the date until a specific time. Then save it a fucking week. If it was taped anyway, nobody knows when you taped it. But if you didn't want to advertise it until you got it on tape, tape it and then advertise it. Don't say three days ahead of time, oh, he's going to be on Wednesday night. Wait until you can promote it on your own television, etc. Secondly, if they didn't have this thing down pat to begin with, why did they fucking bandy Shaquille O'Neal's name about at first when Jade Cargill did it? And why was this contrived backstory put in? It could have been real simple. I remember, and this is one thing I've, I've listened to Vince McMahon and Kevin Dunn quite a bit about. They used to love the Sports Center moment when they would get, whether it was Mike Tyson or whether it was some football player or Lawrence Taylor or a celeb, whatever, some athlete that they could get to do something, they'd talk about it's going to be on Sports Center. Kevin Dunn, I can't wait to see him on Sports Center. Because that was then doing what they wanted the professional athlete or the celebrity or whatever to do open them up publicity in new areas in new venues in new ways in front of a new audience and it worked big time with austin and tyson austin and tyson that made sports center but what were they going to say on sports center oh let's recap this folks shaquille o'neal and a professional wrestler's wife were mad at each other on wednesday night on tnt because the professional wrestler's wife or the professional wrestler had 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 an interaction with a friend of Shaquille's that no one has ever heard of, which led to the professional wrestler's wife cussing out Shaquille's friend, and now there's bad blood. What the fuck? And to go back to the original angle, it's amazing to think all that happened, and it was actually, I mean, I know Brandy stole the show, but it was the build up to Jade versus Brandy. Cody's already doing another thing. He's already now doing whatever he's doing with Sting. By the way, this is the third time I could think of Jake, Jade, and Sting. Cody comes out for his promo, and all of a sudden, 30 seconds into it, someone else hits the ring to take over the promo. Keep doing the yeah, same thing and, over and over again. Well, and even besides the fact that apparently there's not going to be a Cody and Shaq match, because <clears throat> they're already doing Cody or something else. And well, well, who knows? Who knows? But here's the thing. The way this shit gets on Sports Center and the way it crosses over to a new audience and the way that you get your mileage out of your celebrity is not by letting the celebrity play along in your world and become one of the boys and part of the scripted entertainment, but it's that rare interaction where you can have with a couple of guys that people might buy something about it and or, or at least not insult them because it's plausible. Shaquille O'Neal is a huge NBA legend, right? An NBA on TNT. And Shaq has a show on TBS and Shaq Life or on TNT or whatever. And he's on Inside NBA and now the new wrestling company. Why didn't they, it doesn't need to be in the ring. This wasn't. Why didn't they just wait until they had worked something out? for Shaquille O'Neal to appear in such a, on a such and such date that they could at least get something on tape and then concoct the story. And it could have been very simple. They're going to give awards to Shaquille O'Neal for his program on TNT and to AEW for his program, the TNT folks. They love awards in television. Shaquille's going to be there. Cody Rhodes, one of the EVPs, is going to be accepting for his promotion or his program maybe do one of those press conferences socially distanced but it's an announcement it's an award ceremony and they both Shaquille and Cody make their thank you speeches and as is sometimes happens Shaquille O'Neal is a guy who's outside wrestling but he's an athlete right he might say something that rubs some of the wrestling people the wrong way, even though he's just trying to be in the spirit of the thing. Maybe he would say to Cody, hey, too bad, I, you know, I never got into wrestling. I could have give your old man the shackalizer or something. And Cody, yeah, yeah, that'd have been, that'd have been cool. And maybe Cody could say something like, yeah, me, we, me and Dusty Rhodes, we'd have been a, with him as my sidekick. We'd have been America's team. And then Cody could say, wait a minute, you, you really think 
that my dad would have been your sidekick? Well, what, I don't. I didn't mean to mean anything by it. I'm just playing around. No, no, no. You really think that if you'd have got into wrestling instead of basketball, that you would have been a bigger star than my dad? Hey, I'm not trying to knock your dad. I was just, no, no, it's okay. I see what you're saying, but let me tell you something. My dad took me to the Omni in Atlanta to see you play in the NBA when I was a kid, and the building wasn't full. I remember going to see my dad wrestle in the Omni, and that building was full, but you didn't fill it up. <laughs> and maybe then Shaq could say, hey, I remember seeing your dad wrestle in the Omni. It didn't look like he filled it up. It looked like he ate it. And just getting a goddamn deal and then fucking point some fingers at each other. And there's your sports center moment. The flashes are going off. The wrestler stepping up to the giant basketball player. And then if you don't have a match afterwards, you ain't in any worse position as you were after this fucking four finger stinker. And if you do have a match, it would be a legitimate starting point for it. And it's something that would play on a non wrestling program because, hey, it's these two guys getting into a fucking beef. Leave the fucking amateur girl and the wives and girlfriends and this rest of this dra dramatic ha ha out of it and just have two guys have an interaction. That's the same thing they did with Tyson and those guys. Does that make a little more sense if you've got access to this guy and he's part of the TNT TBS family? Even if he doesn't want to do a wrestling match, the people thought that as soon as they did that Shaq thing with old Jane Cargill, three weeks ago, they started thinking they're going to see Cody against Shaq. Well, they'd still be thinking if they did what I said, but it would have been a more entertaining fucking way to get into it. I agree with you to a point. The only thing is Cody would never do any of that because I don't know if you know this, but he won't do anything if it centers around his dad. If you notice, no one's ever done an interview in AEW saying anything about Dusty. He the won't. Rhodes family, he's the American Nightmare, which is a play on the American Dream. He just got his goddamn, the rights to use his name in wrestling back from the evil empire. Who has ever and done a promo in AEW mentioning Dusty? And you're talking to, to Shaquille O'Neal, who was one of the biggest basketball players in the world at a concurrent time where Dusty was still one of the biggest wrestlers in the world. You can't make a little exception. Again, name, I mean, Cody's been in some pretty big feuds. Has anyone ever mentioned Dusty? All right, I'm just saying uh, it would have been a, a little bit more intriguing than Jane Cargill and Brandy getting in a fucking fuss and Shaquille coming over to promote that fight to me. How many turns has Brandy done so far? I mean, I don't know if this technically well, she is a doesn't, turn. She doesn't turn. She just, whatever side of the bed she wakes up on, either grumpy bitch or, you know, a, a friendly executive or Butch Reed. <laughs> All right, the next thing on this parade of terror, the Inner Circle's ultimatum, folks. Jericho told them no ifs, ands, or buts, no uncertain terms. They got to get their shit together. They've had seven days. They're either going to stay together or they're going to break up forever. Oh, the horror. And this was so important that Santana just said, fuck it, and didn't show up. <laughs> Which I assume well, he's no, be, no, no, he, he's got to be quarantined somewhere. No, there's apparently a uh, death in his family, and okay, we well, send our but, condolences. But no, but I wasn't even saying that he was doing that for real. That's the way he, the Jericho, f covered him not being there. He said, and Santana got so pissed off, he just didn't show up for work. They could have at least said his because that's the whole thing. Jericho told him they all had to get along or break up, so Santana. Couldn't his plane have been canceled and he couldn't be there, but he's, he's willing to go with whatever Ortiz says? Because already Santana not being there on purpose violated what Jericho had laid out for the whole thing anyway. I'm trying to make this logical. They were going to air all their grievances. And MJF gave another great verbal performance. He could even do the over-the-top cheesy stuff. Well, it's natural for him and his personality it's only when they go into the obvious stupid cooperation that it he can't even save it uh and sammy's still mad at him they started to confront mjf about was he going to throw in the towel and everybody was seeming to take this halfway seriously unlike all the recent inner circle interviews nobody got goofy and hokey and ortiz of all people was the one to talk sense and bring them together the one that usually acts like he's doesn't know whether to wind his ass or scratch his watch, and he's goofy. 
that's what I was going to say. Uh, you know, I was really not a fan of Ortiz early on. Like, if you remember like a year ago, he was always yeah, sticking the, his tongue out and acting faces silly. faces and silly. The last and here month, he came. Yeah, the last month or so, he has kind of delivered. I mean, in the ring, it's still a different story, but at least he's been a serious... He's been a human being. He's been a normal yeah. guy. Go back and watch a year ago. His tongue's flying all over the place. He's not comfortable on camera, it seems. But he's really come into his own the last few weeks. You got to say that, because I called him out previously for bad shit, but he's been really good. But uh, Sammy still doesn't like any of it, which is good. You got to have the conflict. Um, Hager and Wardlow are still grumpy at each other, so they, they didn't, you know, bury that. But they're staying together, folks. I hate to spoil it for you, but they're sticking together. And they all put their fingers in. Instead of doing the four horsemen thing with joining hands, they put a fucking fuck you finger in. Uh, this was not bad for the, what the inner circle's been doing lately. I'm trying to look on the positive side. They actually kind of were halfway straight with this. Eh. The whole... <laughs> they finally let Wardlow talk, and this is what they do with him? Have him and Hager do a little bit? Yeah, well, I know. Sammy's been great. MJF, when he's not getting dragged down to Jericho level, has been great. Ortiz has been great. Wardlow's good. <laughs> if I was going to have Wardlow finally start cutting promos, this wouldn't be it. Yeah. Jericho's a waster at this point in time. And that's really all you could say about it. This went nowhere. Well, speaking of nowhere, uh, Officer Barb Brady was back. He was busier on this program than anywhere ever. I will say one thing about Alex Marvez. He's got a great memory. He recited this preamble to this promo, the question that he was pitching FTR and Tully. The problem is, is that I recognize all the words as being English. I've heard them all before. And, and if I sit down and, and think about it, I understand it. But he puts so it's so completely devoid of any inflection or emphasis or <laughs> phrasing. It's just a string of words all put together with no real meaning to it. And it just over and over again. And then FTR said some stuff. And I don't know that if I'm sure what anybody said in this interview, except that FTR was saying we're the greatest tag team in the world. And they've done absolutely not been allowed to do nothing to prove that. What did they say here? I'm not exactly sure other than the point I brought up earlier where Tully said that, you know, don't feel too bad about losing because I wasn't with you. Yeah. Because he would have stopped. I all could those. have been there to, to not interfere like I do every other time. <laughs> all right. Real quick. We're, we're, we're bringing this one home. Uh, Eddie Kingston, the butcher and the baker with the candlestick maker. were in a six man tag match with the Lucha brothers and Lance Archer. Six heels. They're all mad at each other. And they jump-started the match by Lance Archer running to the ring and diving over the top rope onto all three of the other heels who were standing there to catch him. And he's fucking 6'6 and 275 pounds, so I don't see how they could have missed him. And jump-start, six-way, and everybody hit the floor, and it's a heel versus heel match, and I'm fucking out. And I don't know what the fuck happened. What happened? I don't know. Um, I will say this, though. Jake Roberts has one thing going for him in wrestling. And that is his ability to cut a promo. Yeah. When was the last time Jake spoke? I don't know. What is the point of having Jake there to escort a six foot six guy who runs to the ring, Jake can't run, and jumps over the rope and just starts things up? What is and Jake's purpose? Jake never interferes. Jake doesn't do anything. He doesn't do anything. That's what, and 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 we are not blistering Jake here, folks. I'll blister like, Jake. I'll, I'll blister Jake. He well, enjoys the taste of his own piss. He well, he enjoy he enjoys getting paid to do absolutely nothing. But the the thing is, everybody's saying, "Well, what's he supposed to do?" Well, something, and that's up to the employer to have a reason for him to be there, to talk or to interfere or to add, not to just walk out and watch what's going on. And it's not like Jake can just go out there and pick up a chair and start wailing people on his own. I guess he could. It'd be entertaining. Why are these people here? Anyway, then after that match, in the back, guess what happened? Chaos. In the back, 
all the girls yelling and pointing fingers at each other because Jane Cargill has hit somebody else off camera. And they're yelling at each other. Like I told you, in AEW, it's pretty safe unless you're one of the female wrestlers. And then it's always just chaos. It's like the way Vince McMahon books midgets. Just everyone behaves like a yes. child and just yes. runs around like crazy, like their head's on fire. And and especially if if it's a midget who is English is a second language, that's an even better. That's a that's a fucking double header right there for Vince. Um then the next match was the AEW women's division. No, we didn't get Serena Deeb. No, we didn't get Thunder Rosa. We got Abaddon. The only time I've ever seen Abaddon was when she was on what week or two ago and she scared old Hikaru Shida because she was crawling to the ring at a glacial snail's pace. She crawled to the ring here and then she stood up. I couldn't tell she was standing up because she was four feet ten, but she was apparently, as I took a second look, standing up. Abaddon is four foot ten, pudgy, pale, not just from the makeup, with the worst physique I've ever seen on a female athlete, and a gimmick of uh, horror face paint and contact lenses, and it looks like she might need some Propecia she's losing her hair she's got a five head not a forehead and this is what everybody's scared of and she's facing the the feared and deadly tasha price so guess what i did for this match you pressed pause you got some popcorn you came back and you sat down and watched it well you'd be right except that no i didn't do that i pressed fast forward kept the popcorn in the pantry I fast forwarded to at the end, Sheeta came out, the baby face, nails Abaddon in the head with a kendo stick, knocks her flat, and helps up old Tasha Price, and Abaddon does an Undertaker sit up. So this really is now cosplay wrestling on television, where they're doing the. It's like one of those. European tours they used to have where it was like a WWF tribute show in the 80s. They couldn't get the real names, so they got guys to dress up in Sergeant Slaughter's outfit and Hulk Hogan's boa and whoever the fuck and 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 just gave a, a cosplay tribute. This is what now they're doing Undertaker shit, the girls over here? What the fuck is this? Have you ever seen this twat before or would ever care to see her again? I've seen her a few times. I believe she was the one who got injured a few weeks back in a match, and they didn't air it. Um, I don't want to see this anymore. It's No. Look, I like a horror movie like everyone else, but she is disturbing, and I'm not saying her as the person. I don't know what she looks like when she doesn't have the Abaddon makeup on, but boy, I do not need to see Abaddon anymore. Yeah, she needs, she needs to do a few sit-ups. She's got a bigger muffin top than old fucking Chuck Taylor. I'm not, I'm just, just the whole visual of the face is just, I don't know what's going on there. No, I don't disturbing. know. disturbing. Well, speaking of disturbing, in the next segment, we, we saw the sublime and the ridiculous at the same time. Don Callis is having a ball. And I, as a matter of fact, go back in the archives. I don't know if it's on Patreon yet. He's been on my show here in the past. We talked about. It is on Patreon. It is on Patreon, and we talked about, I thought he could have been one of the better managers in the business back in the 90s. That's why I got him wormed into the WWF for a while. And they obviously mistreated him and didn't appreciate what was going on with Don Callis the Jackal. But it, this is it's like, uh, Olivier and Callis arrive in a helicopter. It looked a lot cooler when Flair did it in Charlotte and landed in the stadium. But... Here's the thing, if you notice, for one thing, I would have thought that Olivier could have floated in himself because he's lighter than air. But he gets out of the helicopter and looks around and the camera follows him. And then they have a cutaway back to the helicopter. Don Callis is getting out of the same seat that Omega was just in. And he, they didn't <laughs> think to get a three-seat helicopter. They only got a two-seater. So they had to cut to Callis getting out of it when he was already on the ground. Anyway. They did the big entrance that I fast-forwarded through, except I think they added more dancing broom girls this time. Watching Kenny Olivier surrounded by all those dancing broom girls 
It's like watching a vegetarian surrounded by prime rib. What the fuck? Is it? <laughs> so then they get in the ring and Shivani social distanced Don Callis. Shivani acted like he was going to bow up at Don Callis and you're disgusting. And Callis takes the microphone and Tony backs off like he had a fucking gun on him or he was afraid he was contagious. But Callis is what Olivier needs, or at least one of the things that he needs, a promo, a manager, a guy to talk for him. The more that Don Callis speaks and the less that Olivier speaks, the better off everybody is. And Callis did the promo while Olivier stood there displaying the ounce of personality and charisma he has. And Callis gives him the big build up and gives him the microphone. And finally, uh, Olivier tells the truth. <laughs> They basically came, did you hear, he basically came out and said, we just played the nepotism and favoritism game better than everybody else in this company, and we've fucked y'all, and, and it basically just admitted that Tony Khan, this is the story now, that Tony Khan is a sucker money mark, and everybody's been trying to get their friends jobs and successful at it, but they did it better than everybody, and now they're running the place because they were smarter than everybody else, and they took this sucker for more money than the other people took him for. Was this the the interview that I heard them give? Kind of, yeah. I mean, that was basically the the things they said, and and then and Olivier sang his thing and gloated that everybody fell for it and a lot of inside shit. He was trying to imitate Ole Anderson at one point. Um, this was another. He was trying to go into that Al Pacino fucking you know, a method acting impersonator at a method acting class type of thing where he was having a mental meltdown. And, and then they went back to the fucking helicopter, I guess. And only one of them got to get back in it. Maybe they, but then maybe they strapped callous to the fucking runners and took him off. But yeah, two seat helicopter and three people in it. What'd you think of this? You know, there are some people comparing callous and Omega to Bockwinkle and Heenan. Oh, for... All right. I, I don't know what to think. I'm not as high on Don Callis as you are. Well, no, I now, hold on now. I liked his shit, and, and I'm not backing up on what I just said, but when you've just said that people are comparing him to Bobby Heenan, I'm sorry, Don Callis may be closer to Bobby Heenan than Kenny Olivier is to Nick Bockwinkle, but still, there's room. I like Callis's shit because he's a a snide promo and you you can believe that he's a snide fucking asshole but uh, let's not suddenly find the second coming of bobby heenan for fuck's sake i think this is a better version of omega but he really quickly went from wearing his pajamas to wearing suits and now he says he's back to being the new japan omega like you said now ever since you said it all i could focus on is him singing his promos <laughs> He doesn't know how to talk like a normal person. He doesn't know how to be convincing. He comes across just... He's playing a part. He's one of these fucking guys that sits in the corner and jacks off about his video games on his fucking telephone and I mean, he fucking has no personality whatsoever and, and thinks he's a goddamn artist. And this is not wrestling to him. I don't doubt that he's a douchebag. But he's not this douchebag. <laughs> he's not just any douchebag. And boy, the helicopter. Do you remember when Ric Flair landed at the helicopter? Boy, that was a big deal. Great American bash. This was it just, was on the evening news. This was just, hey, it's it's Wednesday. It's a douchebag. Here and he man, comes. I thought I missed something because I didn't rewind it. But when Omega got out, I started walking. Then I shot back to Callus and I'm like, was he, he wasn't sitting there. Was Omega no, that, sitting that, on his no, lap? That's what, no, that, well, that's what you... <laughs> see, you could have even said, because I had the line ready. I was going to say, well, Omega must have been sitting on Callus's lap. <laughs> but when, when, when Kenny got out, you could clearly see the seat was empty. And then the camera pans away and cuts right back, and, and there's Callus sitting in the seat. And there, was, and there was not even any room to climb from a back seat that apparently didn't exist. It, I don't know, whatever the... It just, it's like watching... It's like watching people pretend to be wrestlers doing things that they've seen wrestlers do. It's like the greatest hits of all of the incidents that you remember from the territories without the great setups 
the wonderful follow throughs or the incredible execution of the talented performers. It's just incidents that some goof remembers seeing when he was a kid or when he was, whether he was a kid chronologically or just a kid mentally, it's people playing wrestling and wrestler. And I, and they're now, at least with callous, like I said, as long as Olivier doesn't have to open his mouth any more than necessary, Callus is 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 stronger with him than he is without him. But then he's going to at some point have to have a different kind of match besides this thirty minute fucking bullshit that he does, where he pulls out all these video game moves and it's all the same and it makes no sense. And then and he does a little canter. Somebody sent me some horse show footage of Kenny Olivier competing the canter, the little canter before he does his video game knee lift. It, it, you know, let's see what they come up with. Your closing thoughts on Helicopter Boy. Those were my closing thoughts. And I didn't watch Impact, so I didn't get to see whatever they did on that show, which... No. I'm never going to watch. I will I will go over the main event on this program quickly, because it, once again, it was a letdown. For the Diamond Ring, the second annual Dynamite Diamond Battle Royal, MJF won it last year. This year, it came down to, as we remember last week, MJF and the boss's favorite wrestler, My Little Dog Pockets. And so now we are treated again to the sight of a qualified, talented professional having to do a -a make-a-wish match with a fucking guy dressing up and not even dressing up as a wrestler. He doesn't dress like a wrestler. He just plays one that gets indulged because the boss, you know, likes him. Because he's figured out a way to suck up to the boss. The nepotism and favoritism deal. So at least MJF jumps him at the bell. MJF is smart. He knew he couldn't fucking do anything competitive with this guy back and forth and it not be shit, right? So he jumps him at the start and starts getting the heat on him and the guy sells. It's like watching a pro work out with a kid to training seminar. But he kept, MJF kept control of it. He was the best heel on the show so far because at least he works like a heel and takes sh- shortcuts and cheats. But in this thing, they've set up that their their big annual battle royal that leads to a TV main event on national television can possibly be won by, or at least is definitely going to involve, one of their comedy job guys. So how can this be a big deal? It's like if the, if the first Royal Rumble or the second Royal Rumble was won by, you know, fucking Barry Horowitz. Uh, it's not to knock Barry. They they went to the break. After the break, Pockets just made a huge comeback out of nowhere doing all the goofy shit that he normally does. And I thought it's ridiculous to put MJF in this position, but at this point, nobody on the roster has any importance to, to gain new viewers. They've nullified that on everybody. They've cut everybody's balls off. So it's not crucial now that a top guy that could be an attraction is being made to stooge for this idiot. But the joke wasn't funny at first, and it's over a year old now. So it's way past not funny. MJF went to give Pockets the faceplant pile driver deal that he does in the ropes, and Pockets backdropped MJF out. Actually, MJF had to jump and go out himself because Pockets didn't put any oomph in it. And then the entire inner circle, the top heel group, including a former WWE champion, and the goddamn current Bellator mixed martial arts fighter had to stand there while the little fucking goof dove on him. And then MJF finally hit his move, and he got a two count with the feet on the ropes. Then they did comedy spots. The old deal where Eddie Guerrero used to do this primarily, he didn't start it, he didn't invent it, it's been done before, but where the fucking baby face or the cat, the guy that people sympathy is behind will throw the heel, a fucking gimmick like a bat or a chain or something. When the heel catches it, then the baby face would go down and like he'd been hit, right? Eddie Guerrero would do that. And the referee would turn around and say, Oh, you motherfucker, you hit him with the deal, right? Well, MJF gets the ball bat and then pitches it to fucking pockets and lays down, but Pockets doesn't catch the bat. So MJF gets mad and fucking grabs the bat back, and then Pockets takes a bump 
And the referee turns around and sees MJF with the bat. But MJ, and he didn't buy that MJF had hit pockets with the bat. He didn't disqualify it. He's just asking him and ranting at him about it. So what were they doing that spot to begin with if it wasn't going to be an automatic disqualification when the referee saw this? And when they they had had, let's face it, it's a goddamn favor to this little goof that they allow him to play. He's a piece of shit and everybody knows it. He's an embarrassment. He weighs 160 pounds. His whole gimmick makes wrestling look bad. But at least they had something going. And then they start both obviously cooperating with each other to do this comedy bullshit and ruined what small, minuscule portion of a decent match that they had going. And when they started doing that back and forth with the bat and the thing and the referee then said, oh, blah, 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 I fast forwarded. I said, fuck it. I now can't even watch MJF, who was one of my only favorites because he's just being brought down to their level. So I fast forwarded to the very last of the program where Miro, the Bulgarian brute, dressed in his designer finest, comes out to help screw pockets. So MJF, that is a is supposedly they're looking at as the future of the company, a young star, under, he's in the inner circle. He's a top fucking guy. He needs help not only from people in his group, like Chris Jericho and the MMA fighter and the former tag team champions, blah, 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 whatever the fuck. But also he needs help from an ex WWE guy to come out and beat this fucking Jack off with his hands and stuck in his pockets. And Miro, once again, the way he was dressed, as I've mentioned, he told his little buddy Pip Sabian to go over to Cox's and get him a Sears sucker suit. But Pip got mixed up and went to Sears instead. And it didn't turn out well for poor old Miro. And that was the end of this program. At least I think it was. I couldn't watch anymore. I didn't want to pay attention to that. Did did I miss anything with MJF's continued downward spiral? That was indeed the end of the program. <sighs> I don't blame MJF here. Well, no, it, it you know it. I'm, well, I I do blame him for cooperating with some of this shit. And once again, and I, guess every I, can, match. I guess I can see not being able to, to say no to Chris Jericho, but you can't go to Tony Khan and say, look, in all seriousness, look at this fucking jack off. Enough's enough. I'm not going to work There's with There's no you. one in that company that thinks that way. They all accept him. They all accept Marco Stunt. They all accept Orange Cassidy. You can go. They all there. accept their paychecks, and that puts on them some fiduciary responsibility to do things for the positive betterment of the company. Oh, As, rather than when the leader, the owner, is a, is an inexperienced amateur goof and needs to be not held accountable because he can't be because he's not he's not accountable for his program because he's in over his head. You can't hold a veterinarian accountable for not being able to do a successful brain transplant on a human. It's not his fucking field. So somebody that's a professional in this chosen occupation should say to Tony Khan, let me explain something to you. Whether you want me to or not, I'm going to get over and draw you some money or get you some ratings, and I'm not fucking playing with these goddamn indie outlaw goofs. I'm going to do things right. And you can fucking push me. You've got me signed, and I'll produce for you. Or you can have me working with these fucking little dick licks, and I'll be as meaningless as everybody else on your roster. But that's up to them. It's never going to happen. Because first of all, Tony Khan thinks he knows all that he needs to know about being a booker and a promoter. And secondly, these guys are all, in some cases, they're happy they're finally getting an opportunity. And they're happy that they have a boss who wants to be their friend. And in other cases, these are guys who work for WWE and they're happy not to be working under Vince McMahon. You have a bunch of people really happy to get those checks. Different hey, reasons. They just had Shaquille O'Neal on the program. And nobody could remember a word he said 30 minutes after it was over with. And nobody gave a shit about the issue that he was involved in as it was happening. That takes talent. That's almost impossible to do. When you have a guy who's one of the most recognizable sports figures in the world, and he appears on your television program, and you can't even remember the shit that happened afterwards because it was so boring and stupid... What the fuck are you? That's almost a gimme. That's a layup. Hey, listen, 
like I said before, every single match had a run in or some kind of angle at the end of it. Every backstage thing almost had the same thing. But it's hard. Still, they, if we weren't there, they're, they're still apologizing. They're still drinking the Kool Aid. They're still, but, but what about? Them? And they're still my taking point up is, for these guys. They can't admit it. They can't, they just can't who's admit they? it. Who's they? They're fans. The the same number of fans that watch every Wednesday night that never gets bigger and ain't never going to get bigger is still saying, oh, they're the greatest thing in the world. When you've, <laughs> in the same program, you can fuck up an appearance by Shaq and fucking make people disinterested in MJF and in Cody for all, for as far as that goes in all of your best talent because they're doing such stupid things, this is almost impossible to do on purpose. Johnson City ain't the only place that needs a refrigerated truck for all the people that are getting buried. And for the record, whether it's Sting, and I think a lot of it's Sting, or whether it's the Omega Angle, which they all immediately ran to expose and talk about the behind-the-scenes mechanisms of, they did do their second number in, I think it was, what, 950... 955 this week and i believe it was their best number in a long time and i think that's more sting than last week because no one knew sting was going to be on last week right this week you kind of expected he'll be on well you were told he'll be on so i think this week's more of a reflection of sting than last week was but that's what i'm saying what are they going to do to get to a million people drop the cow the old saturday night live sketch is cm punk the only person that could get him to a million people no i mean look he he may be the only what, what free about, agent. About a, he may be the good, only free agent. What but. about a good program that people could follow along with and really enjoy every week? That might get them to a million people. They're hot shotting every segment. But that's what I'm saying. When you when you're hot shotting everything and everybody, and you've signed Sting and what in the world is next, and how do you follow that? And you still can't get to a million people. And a million people is half of what Raw or SmackDown are doing, and they're stinky fucking programs. This is where we're going with wrestling, where the the viewership of a national television program for wrestling in 2020 equals the top four markets of the old days of the territories. Yeah, okay. Same amount of people were watching wrestling in Memphis, New Orleans, Houston, and St. Louis as the entire country watches AEW with Sting. I don't know. Your closing thoughts, my boy. I hate NXT. <laughs> it sucks so bad. AEW, I get a perverse joy out of several things. Other things, I watch just I, like, like a lot of the audience. I can't wait to hear what you're going to say about it. They're doing way too much. They have too many people who are not ready for prime time. But it's better than NXT. I'll take AEW over NXT by and large, every single week. Every now and then, NXT does something, and they've got some talented people there, but the presentation sucks. The booking sucks. It's turning into a mini version of Raw. I don't like it at all. And that's all I gotta say. Well, just remember, folks, next week, it'll be Brandy Rhodes with Cody in the corner against Jane Cargill with her little buddy Shaq. They didn't announce the match, did they? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I am you don't crazy. you never know. I mean they announced Shaq's gonna be on the show on social media. They didn't even announce it on their TV show that one of the all-time NBA legends is gonna be on their show. Oh. Hey, and that's another thing. If he would have done it then, nobody would have known it was done. They could have held it a week and advertised it on their television. But they don't get it. All right, we're done here, I think. For this way, you know, you need to. I'm going to give you an ultimatum. In the next seven days, you're either going to be in a good mood or we're going to break up forever. Next week, right here on the program, you have to be in a, you have to be in a good mood, and you have to, you have to hug Tony Schiavone and and say, "Bring it in, kid," and all that stuff, and be in a good mood and compliment these people, or we're going to break up forever, like the inner circle almost did. Well. If we're going to be reviewing these shows again next week, let me just say in advance, say la vie. Say la vie, say la vie. That's just the way it goes. And until next week, that's the way it goes around here, folks. 
Uh, I, if you haven't already ordered for Christmas, it's too late. Just don't send me any more money. I can't take it. I love all of you, but you're driving me crazy. For Brian, I'm Jim. Until next week when we sacrifice more of our brain cells to tell you what's wrong with modern pro wrestling. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye, everybody.